Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Committee of the Whole for November the 21st. Uh, as we gather we, and call the meeting to order, we just acknowledge that the land on which we're gathered is the traditional territories of the Coast and Strait Salish people. Specifically, we recognize the Kwangan speaking people known today as the Songhees and Esquimalt nations, and that their historic connections to these lands and adjoining waters continues to this day. Uh, this is a committee of the whole, and so for those not used to the difference, uh, we are sitting as an informal body tonight. We won't be making any decisions, um, but this format allows us to meet and, uh, and uh, discuss things in a more informal fashion. Uh, tonight we're primarily looking at financial planning, um, but we have another a number of other agenda items before we get to that, so I'll get to that right away. Um, can I just have a motion to approve the agenda? Moved and seconded, thank you. Any discussion? See none. All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Uh, we have adoption of the Committee of the Whole Minutes from June 20th. That seems like a long time ago now. Moved and seconded. Are there any corrections, changes, amendments? I don't see any. All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Uh, we have up next Mayor and Council of Verbal Reports. This is a section where we, uh, Committee of the Whole, just allow for uh, members of Council as they sit on other duties. Uh, uh, over the course of it, we have Royal McPherson Theatre Society, for example, here tonight, so the representative could come and if there is uh, issues of interest to the broader community that they wanted to share back to this table, this is the opportunity to do that. Uh, I'm happy just to, if anybody wishes to raise their hand and, and uh, have any updates, you can do so. I appreciate that a lot of uh, members probably haven't had a chance to meet with their new bodies yet. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Mayor. And last week um, was an interesting kickoff for Crest meetings since the election. We held the um, executive, the finance, and the and the board committee meeting all in the same week. So no um, no new issues really to report, but many new faces around the um, around the board table. We have several members are returning because many represent um, different. Uh, uh, transit authority, the police authorities, different. So those those people are all returning, but the elected officials, um, there's a, a very small group of us <laughs> that are carryovers from the from the last uh, last term. So, but nevertheless, we're off to a start, and now uh, that's those meetings are concluded, sort of for the year, and we will um, move on to new meetings in January and revisiting. We're still working on, of course, the planning for the developing um, a new building for Crest. So that's all I have to report. Thank you, Councillor Patterson. Any others? Uh, go ahead, Councillor Green. Yes, not, not related to any committee work, but on your behalf and at your request, I attended Kristallnacht um, on November the 9th, I believe the date was, uh, at, the, at the synagogue downtown, and that was to acknowledge um, in view of threats that were made uh, to the Jewish Film Festival, International Film Festival, um, the synagogue and the rabbi brought everyone together, community leaders and others, and uh, we all stood in and uh, issued a pledge of support against hate speech and anti-Semitism. So it, it was a very moving ceremony, and I appreciate the opportunity to attend on behalf of you and Oak Bay. Thank you, Councillor Green. Uh, any other? Go ahead, Councillor Smart. I had the opportunity to meet with the Heritage uh, Commission last week and um, had a very productive meeting. There were essentially three things on the agenda. Um, there was a main um, uh, project review regarding a, a porch that was resolved easily and then we carried on to chat about a residence request um, regarding a possibility of having a heritage sign on, on a boulevard property which staff is looking into um, the logistics of and then uh, we had a really good interactive discussion about the work plan. Um, but fantastic um, group, um, yeah. Councillor Smart, any other pieces to go? Go ahead, uh, Councillor Watson and then, and then Appleton. Yes, just to say that I was one of a number of us who attended the South, South Island Prosperity Partnership conference that uh, ran last week. I was able to go with some of us on that first evening when I thought the content was absolutely excellent. It was a great networking opportunity and also some very good content. And I know that Hazel, um, Councillor Braithwaite, um, can, was able to go for the balance of the event. So I um, just wanted to uh, let the community know that we were... We were, we were engaged with that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, there was good representation from Oak Bay at that event. Go ahead, Councillor Appleton. 
Uh, thank you, Worship. Just in my capacity as, um, I, I jumped the gun, but in my capacity as liaison to Heritage, uh, the Heritage Foundation, I distributed to Council, I think at last meeting, uh, the copies of the 2020 and 2021 annual reports, which they had a hard copy printed up of. So I think everybody's already in receipt of that, but I just wanted to just remind Council that those were distributed. And as usual, they're prepared in their usual, you know, extremely high quality, very well done graphic style. So it's a, it's a nice document and a nice read in and of itself just for aesthetics and then also just we'll update um, we did have in fact had in between the uh, election and the inaugural meeting there was a meeting of the GVPL library board um, on October the 25th and the main uh, component there um, as as ongoing council members are aware and, and just to apprise new council members that they've a uh, five-year budget and and uh, finances were were approved by the board at that meeting so council will be seeing the outcome of that in short order thank you worship thank you Councillor Upland. go ahead Councillor Braithwaite um, thank you. And just a plug for the library at SIP. Um, that was one of the main things they talked about was how important a library was to the community. So <clears throat> um, I'm, g I'm not going to give an RMTS update because we have representation here. And just a notification that um, we do have our first Parks, Rec, and, and uh, Culture meeting next week. So I'll look forward to giving an update after that. Thank you. Very oh, go ahead, Councillor Green. Um, through you to Councillor Braithwaite. Could you tell us what time the light up starts on Sunday? Um, someone was asking, so I, I knew you would know. <laughs> I will channel myself through Mrs. Claus, and I believe that the uh, light up starts at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on Sunday. But there's also the Santa Claus Parade on Friday, which is not in Oak Bay, but yeah. And is the, is the actual light up light up at 5 o'clock? I believe the actual light up light up is at 5 because it has to be dark enough to see the lights. But there's other activities from 2 o'clock on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Those who know what we're talking about, every uh, the last Sunday of every November, there is the Business Improvement Association puts on a light up where all the lights on the avenue get turned up, and uh, Santa Claus comes and visits, and uh, there's music and singing and roasted chestnuts and all the good stuff. So uh, I don't. I, all I will just say is, uh, so the CRD has met, and uh, for the first time, all of the procedural pieces, I was elected as the chair of the hospital district. Uh, which I think is uh, is very honoured to, to take that role on, uh, and strategic planning for that body will be starting uh, uh, next week. So uh, lots of work going on at that the, at the regional table. I'll be uh, pleased to bring you back updates as our strategic planning moves forward. Uh, seeing no other hands, I'm going to move on to other uh, pieces. We have public comment and question period. Um, right after this, we have delegations. So if you're here with delegations. Uh, uh, just uh, if you could just wait, uh, we. Uh, this is a moment in time, and again, I'm just going to give this a minute because sometimes there's a bit of a delay from uh, our meeting if it's going out through YouTube to get to the live stream, uh, and so uh, this uh, moment is just a place for people, public uh, in attendance or online, uh, that wish to address council on items of interest to Oak Bay. Uh, they are welcome to do so. If they've called in, uh, they can uh, to the one eight five five number. They can raise their hand by hitting star nine. Uh, nobody has showed us called in on here, but if I do, uh, and I'm not sure if anybody that's online right now wishes to speak, if you're on the Zoom call, has anybody registered to speak? No. So if anybody wishes to, uh, is on Zoom and wishes to speak, you can use the raise hand function within Zoom. Uh, you can hit star nine if you called into the 1855 number. And just given the delays, usually we're a bit flexible on this one, so uh, uh, not seeing anybody singing that they wish to address council. I'm going to move on to the delegates, uh, delegations section of our agenda, um, and we have uh, two delegations here tonight. Uh, up first, we have, uh, I believe, Liam Cobb, uh, beekeeper. Uh, why don't you come to the f uh, speaker's podium? You can have a seat. Uh, you can bring your props if you wish. Absolutely. It won't show up on the camera, just so you know, at home, but uh, we can see it in here. And. Uh, you have five minutes, uh, and once once you start speaking, and you have to speak into the microphone, or else people at home can't hear you. So, okay, good. Right. I'll I'll get. Are there, are there handouts? Yeah, you can you can pass them over here, and we can pass them around. Oh, just just wait till you get to the microphone. Thanks. <laughs> we 
can't accept <laughs> gifts anyway, so it's, uh, we'll, we'll make sure they get to a good home. <laughs> If you could just uh, yeah, hop down and, and so if you yeah, again if you could just state your name, your municipality of residence, and uh, then you have up to five minutes to address council. Welcome. Fantastic. Uh, thank you. So my name is Liam Cobb. I reside in uh, in Saanich, but I'm here at the um, at Oak Bay to propose some amendments to the beekeeping bylaw here in your municipality. Um, the reason being, I'm a beekeeper for ten years or so. And for the past six years, I've been working with an educational beekeeping company named Alveol. We started our business 10 years ago in Montreal, and we've slowly been expanding our services to various cities across Canada, the United States, and just this past recent year uh, into Europe. And this year, I came to Victoria. It's my first time beekeeping in Victoria. And I've been installing high projects on the rooftops of commercial buildings and apartment buildings around the various municipalities. I'm here today because I was invited by the Oak Bay Beach Hotel to install one of my educational high product projects on the roof of their hotel. Um, however, as the current bylaws stand, um, they fall outside of the, the zoning restrictions. And so I'm considering, or I'm asking some considerations for adjusting the restrictions around urban beekeeping to allow for hives to be placed on um, properties that are outside the current zones, which are single family use and institutional buildings. Um, that's, uh, that's, the, that's why I'm here today. And I was hoping, I would imagine you probably have some questions about beekeeping and uh, you know, why perhaps these would be, could be beneficial changes. Sure, well, and I'm happy to go a little, little bit of back and forth on this one. Generally, we get a, pr a presentation. If there's any questions, we'll take them. But uh, okay. Uh, certainly, it's within my time on council that we passed the beekeeping allowances, so we had a lot of uh, education at that time, but there's been people who joined council since then. If there's any questions, we'll take them, but we're going to keep this restricted to the five minutes. So is there any... I think your uh, your summary was actually very succinct and clear, actually, the, the reason for the ask, so uh, so I appreciate that. Okay. Uh, can I ask, you have another proposed amendment, which is to include proof of permission. Mm -hmm. So could you explain what that, uh, why that one? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, in interpreting your beekeeping bylaws, first of all, I'll say that the beekeeping bylaws in Oak Bay, they're clearly very well informed by what I call the no nuisance beekeeping guidelines. So these are rules meant to keep the public safe, as well as like, make sure that any apiculture or any beekeepers are managing their hives in a way where, um, well, there's, that's in the name, no nuisance. You don't want to bother your neighbors and you don't want to bother the public. And it's clear that, you know, you, you've set your parameters very clearly. The reason for including, including the First Amendment is that if we were to open up the zoning restrictions to, um, to open up, you know, namely in my interest, like apartment buildings is what I'm interested in, multifamily, do multifamily dwellings, then you may find that there are more tenants interested in doing this. And so this would just kind of be a measure to make sure that they had to go through the controls of their building first before coming to the Oak Bay. Because what I see in, in your application process, like it's a very thorough process. Um, you know, you want to have a demonstration of responsibility in terms of their installation, but also I think there's also kind of like a, a, a labor management where you don't want to have a flood of applications all the time. And so putting this first amendment would mean that anybody who's interested, regardless of what parcel zone they live on, would have to go through somebody who has like, you know, authority over that parcel and then they would get the first kind of like check yes or no. And if it's a yes, then they proceed to, to, the, to the application. Thank you, Mr. Cobb. Yeah. Councilor Braithwaite, you had a question? Uh, yes, thank you so much. Um, so I'm wondering, what other municipalities have these changes to their bylaw or have this in, um, ingrained in their bylaws? Is it Saanich, I would assume, since you're from Saanich? Are there any other municipalities that have it in there? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Here in the Greater Victoria area, every um, municipality, with the exception of Colwood, have like fairly, like their, their alignments are a little less restrictive. With them, they have similar principles in terms of barriers of space between where your hive is and, and the nearest like walkway, for example, or like the, the, the line of like where your property ends. What's fairly common is approximately seven meters. I think you guys are at six meters. It's six meters to seven meters for Oak Bay. And so in most situations, the they vary slightly across the various municipalities um, in, in Victoria, but so long as you're respecting like this minimum distance and in some cases like number of hives, then you're in compliance with the municipal bylaws. Council, briefly. 
Thanks, and just so, and, and but also specifically for the multi-family units, you have in, in Saanich, et cetera, there's bylaws for the, for the multi-family units as well. That's right. In some in other municipalities, there's uh, there's no zoning restrictions. In Colwood, there are firmer zoning restrictions in current terms of urban beekeeping. Thank you for that. I'm, we're just uh, we're finishing up the five minutes of time here, so I don't want to go uh, too much further. Are there any other questions that members of council wish to ask before we go? Go ahead, Councillor Patterson. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for attending tonight. Um, just. Uh, out of curiosity, how do the hives, if you're if you're going up um, into a multi-residential building, how do the hives um, uh, withstand heavy wind velocities? That's a great question. Um, so managing, oh, well, first of all, we we restrict the number of stories that we install. So like at the highest that we've installed in our largest cities is at 30 stories. That's where we can kind of find that like we start seeing diminishing returns after that point. In Victoria, um, you know, we certainly have windy areas like some of my hives in, in James Bay. They certainly get buffeted. Uh, but with adjustments to the equipment, we can manage any sort of risks associated with wind, whether or not it's risks to the health of the hive or risks to the equipment. As you can see, I'm like strapped down. So the entirety of the unit is like secured to itself to, and to and then you know the combination of, of equipment keeps the bees safe but it also kind of pre prevents any accidents from happening around the, the building itself great thank you very much uh, um, very quick questions because we do want to wrap up the time a lot that we have go ahead councillor green and uh, for, if we can keep the questions related to the asks here not just about generalized pieces of beekeeping councillor watson are there any liability issues associated with building owners who would be asking for these or accepting them that that council wouldn't want to know about if they were going to make changes to a bylaw? Mr. Cobb? I can't speak necessarily to private beekeepers. Um, I can say for our services, our services come included with a built-in insurance um, package, so up to like five million in liability. So. This is kind of where the controls come in place, where it's like, are you coming in as a professional or are you coming in as a amateur? As far as like amateur beekeeping goes, the insurance policy is like, there's not very many concerns that I'm aware of. It's different when you come in as a paid service, which is what we do. Thank you, Councilor Green. Thank you very much, and through you. Thanks, Mr. Cobb. Um, I just wanted to ask you, so you provide all of the services. It's a complete service model. You provide the care, oversight, supervision, um, and ongoing maintenance of the hives. Thank you. I'm just going to not go down that rabbit hole because we can't promote any one business, so I don't want to get into the discussion of the business model at this table if we can avoid that. Go ahead, Councillor Green. I, I was thinking of who, who's responsible for maintaining the hives, that's all. In this case, you, this, this, this uh, organization would be maintain the hives if that was the model, yeah. I just don't want to, we can't really promote any individual business, so we have to be a bit careful about that, but yeah. Good to know there is a business or businesses out there that can do this sort of work. Anything else, Councilor Green? That's great. Mr. Cobb, thank you so much for your time this evening. If you, we'll give you a moment if you want to collect your, uh, your, your, your pieces. Uh, and uh, we have Mr. Larabas uh, next from uh, Royal McPherson Theatre Society. We don't make decisions here tonight, but we can move some things forward and ask questions of staff later. So thank you. Up next, we have a delegation from the Royal McPherson Theatre Society. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Lair Bass, the Executive Director, here with us. Um, no props for you, but we have... Uh, <laughs> uh, if you wanted, if you just, again, uh, for the record, just state your name, uh, your organization, uh, and, uh, and location of that organization, then you are uh, welcome to address Council. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor Murdoch and Councillors. Thank you for this opportunity to uh, speak to you tonight. My name is Franz Lerbass. I live in Esquimalt, and I'm the executive director of the Royal McPherson Theatre Society, which is based in Victoria. Oak Bay participates in CRD bylaw 2587, which is the Royal Theatre as a local service. The Royal and McPherson Theatre Society is a registered charity. On behalf of Oak Bay, we are the stewards and operators of this historic theatre. We also steward and operate the McPherson Playhouse. Together, these two theaters function as a cultural hub. And through this hub, residents of Oak Bay 
engage in a wide variety of performing arts and live entertainment. Each year we welcome over 200,000 audience members to the theaters. And each year we host about 75 different user groups ranging from commercial, not-for-profits, and schools. 45 of the 75 user groups are local organizations such as Pacific Opera Victoria, Ballet Victoria, the Victoria Symphony, the Naden Band, and Oak Bay Zone College, uh, Canadian College of Performing Arts. The Royal McPherson Theatre Society is governed by a volunteer board of directors. And the RMTS sta is uh, staffed by a team of experienced, knowledgeable, and professional, dedicated professionals. In March of 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic closed down the Royal Theatre and the McPherson Playhouse. Just over one year ago, we reopened the theatres to full operating capacity, and we have shifted from resiliency to recovery. Midterm, we are focusing on ensuring ongoing organizational sustainability to continue supporting the performing arts. Long term, we are planning renovations to pre uh, preserve the value of your capital assets. We look forward to working with this council to ensure that uh, the Royal Theatre continues to enrich the quality of life in this region. I am happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lairbass. Um, I think it might be worthwhile just to talk a little bit about the funding model, because uh, that's probably going to be coming back in some form, either to the CRD or to our respective table sometime in the next uh, year or so. Uh, could you maybe just give it a history about that, about how Oak Bay uh, directly funds RMTS? Yes, so <clears throat> through CRD bylaw 2587, uh, that was established in, I believe, 1998. Um, there were two requisitions set up there with participating uh, Oak Bay, Saanich, and Victoria. The requisitions were set up in fixed dollar amounts, which probably seemed okay at the time, but I'm not sure that it was imagined to uh, last this long. And so with increased inflation, we're seeing the value of those uh, requisitions decline, and, and uh, right now we're estimating that the purchasing power of those requisitions is down about 40 percent. So what that means is uh, around 1999, uh, the $100,000 for operating, that requisition amounted to about 10 percent of our operating budget for the Royal Theatre, and now it's worth about uh, 4 percent. So that represents an ongoing uh, challenge. Thank you. And there's a, and in addition to that, I think there's it's a 480,000 in capital as well that is provided. Not that's by that's the three right. owners of the of the. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, so that 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 static nature of that funding is is it's. I'll just put my CRD hat on. It's provided. It's difficult to change that. Um, we, there was an effort a couple of years ago to change the funding model, but uh, because it has to go through approval of all three owners of the royal, uh, it sort of got stalled uh, based on the. The upper cap being uh, growing quite 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 a lot under the provincial rules. We can it, it either has to be fixed or it has to follow this this formula, and the formula grows quickly. So uh, there were some concerns about the lack of controls available, and so that it kind of got stalled. I do expect it to come back again. Are there any other questions of Mr. Lairbass? Yeah, go ahead, uh, Councillor Braithwaite. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just want to thank you very much for coming tonight. Um, it's great to get everybody, as we have a new council, everybody to kind of be on the same page and understanding about um, the RMTS. Um, I'm very happy to be sitting um, as a council liaison. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think that when I look around the faces of that board, um, there are some very um, accomplished people that sit around there. Um, and. Um, the staff that is at the RMTS is very accomplished as well. And so I feel that there's going to be a lot coming forward over the next four years. Um, and I look forward to that um, because we do have to make some changes at both, of, well, at the Royal for us. Um, and um, I look forward to being involved in that. So I'm happy that Oak Bay is hopefully going to be on board for all of those changes coming up. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see any other questions, Mr. Lairbass, but I'll just say on behalf of our council, uh, Thank you so much for all the work. I, I know that you joined the organization, I think, about 30 seconds before COVID was declared. And uh, I've had a fairly tumultuous time of, of managing that process. Uh, and so uh, you and your staff have really been through the ringer on this one. I think the, the performing arts as a whole have really, really felt the impact, uh, probably the most of any any um, uh, any 
area of business or, or, or culture. So I just th thank you for your, your perseverance through that. And, and I'm, it's nice to see coming out the other side that things seem to be, uh, to be going well. So uh, thank you for all that work and to all your staff and to the board. Um, yeah, thank you so much. And with that, we will uh, let you go home. And may I remain if I wish? I, the you financial may. Uh, discussion looks quite interesting to me. Uh, you're absolutely welcome to stay. Yes, please do. We we used to have a bigger audience, and it seems to have people watch it at home now instead of coming into the into the hall. So, uh, yes, uh, welcome. So up next, and the only other piece of, of main business is the uh, Mr. Payne, which is I'm really basically handing us over to uh, uh, to Mr. Payne, uh, and I hope. our orientation process officially. Um, it's really a backgrounder on where we've come from and how we do our financial processes, how we report. And uh, I, it was interesting going through the report. I will say it's, uh, it's the difference between now and even four years ago is quite yeah. quite stark. Uh, for those who haven't been paying much attention, it's, it's nice to see where we are and where we're going. So with that, no more preamble. I'll hand it over to Mr. Payne, our director of Financial Services and Asset Management. Did I get that correct? That Close enough. Okay. okay. There we go. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, why did everyone laugh when Minister Learbess wanted to stay? <laughs> I was going to, now I understand, I was going to suggest that the folks uh, th uh, that are at risk of falling asleep take their uh, Red, Bull, Red Bull right now, and we'll get through this. Um, uh, but I, I put together a PowerPoint presentation that uh, provides uh, similar information, uh, the same information in the report, hopefully a bit more uh, interactive. I would encourage counsel at any point uh, to interrupt me, uh, no problem with that whatsoever, and ask questions. Um, if you have a question, more than likely all seven of you have the same question. <laughs> so whoever's the bravest is the first person to ask. Um, I rattle a lot of information off really quickly, and I uh, take it for granted, my knowledge in, in, in that area. And also, sometimes I say things that are wrong, and I don't realize it because I'm down, I'm down the sentence already. So by all means, interrupt me, please. So uh, just an overview of what we'll talk about today. Uh, we'll start with the role of the CFO and then council's role uh, in terms of developing our framework for financial oversight and all of the processes discussed in today's presentation. Uh, we'll, get, we'll talk specifically about financial planning, just another word for budgeting, um, uh, what our reserves are and what they mean, um, a little bit about debt, a little bit of, about financial reporting, so that's our financial statements that's after the fact, and uh, procurement, asset management, and risk management. Okay, so we'll start just very briefly with the role of the CFO. The community charter itself outlines um, some main um, activities that the CFO must uh, must uh, must uh, do annually. The first one is collecting revenue, uh, treasury and investment, uh, expending funds, financial reporting and financial record keeping, and controllership. Those are the main. Um, uh, 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 that's the main role of the community charter as the, uh, the main role of the CFO as the community charter outlines. There's other uh, important um, activities that the CFO undertakes that's implied throughout the community charter, including financial planning, budgeting, and asset management. Yes. Well, controllers, uh, so the question for the, because I, because I, I noticed you didn't use the mic, so I'll, I'll repeat it in case they're the, under the unlikely, um, uh, situation where someone's actually watching online. I'll repeat the question. Uh, controller, uh, w what is meant by controllership? And controllership essentially is establishing a framework for internal controls in the organization that maintains the financial integrity, so the financial information integrity. So can the auditors come in and uh, review our internal controls and feel confident that they're producing accurate financial records? Um, so that's, uh, that's the fun, that's the most fun uh, 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 role of the CFO, not really. For Depends the record, I think we have about 15,000 viewers on YouTube. That's just my guess, uh, rough, rough guess. <laughs> Excellent. So you speak, you speak for those 15,000 viewers who are wondering what controllership was. And in this uh, organization, um, the uh, CFO also has a role to play in risk management. That's not uh, necessarily a CFO responsibility. It can be a corporate responsibility, and it is. We share we share responsibility and leadership for risk management, but there's a certain um, uh, role that the CFO plays. 
So the next topic is council's role and uh, and especially in developing the financial framework. And the mayor uh, indicated, you know, where the organization was years ago and where it is now. And that's mainly through the direction of council council of the frameworks that needed to be established and maintained. So council establishes the framework and staff implement and maintain those frameworks. So your vision and policy is integrated into these various uh, frameworks. Now the mandatory frameworks that you must uh, produce through the work of your staff that are listed in the, the community charter include the financial plan bylaw. We'll talk about what that, what that means, how is that different from the budget. Uh, it is the budget, but on a high level. Uh, public sector accounting standards, that's what PSAS stands for, financial statements. So that's something that must be produced annually per the community charter. The statement of financial information is something we have to produce, that's through the Financial Information Act. Um, and we'll talk about that, it encapsulates, it encapsulates the, um, the uh, accounting statements as well as uh, a number of other disclosures, and the annual report. Then there's a number of leading practices. Some of these leading practices are pretty standard expectations from any financial department. Some of them are best practices or exceed best practices in Oak Bay's case. Um, recently, the district adopted a new investment policy and that was de developed in cooperation with the Municipal Finance Authority. Um, and so they put their best practices lens on our portfolio and how to uh, actively manage um, the district's portfolio investments. Uh, secondly, there was a sustainable procurement policy that was initially developed in 2020. It's been subsequently amended two or three times since, so it's kind of a living document. Um, that uh, adhered to the Auditor General for Local Government Best Practices. Uh, when, that, when, when that existed, the Auditor General for Local Government doesn't exist anymore. But at that time, they had published detailed best practices for procurement, and that's what that policy was modeled after. Uh, thirdly, uh, the district has established a whistleblower policy. This is a pretty standard document, uh, not required by the community charter or any legislation, but certainly something that the auditors want to see in place so that there's a culture of ethical behavior and an avenue to, um, uh, to report unethical behavior, not just financial unethical behavior, but other behaviors as well. Uh, the, the district's travel and expense reimbursement policy was um, was adopted in 2020. Again, that's a pretty standard uh, document for most financial organizations. And the district uh, implemented quarter two and quarter three budget variance reporting. Variance reporting, again, is a, is a standard practice in, in financial uh, reporting. Um, what uh, What's um, uh, good about our uh, financial reporting for budget variances is it includes full year forecasts. So we come to council at quarter two, we come to council at quarter three, and the whole uh, organization has put together full year spending forecasts. And that allows the finance department and uh, council to foresee perhaps any uh, issues that, that may be arising, make any adjustments to the financial plan bylaw if necessary, or make decisions. There's a lot of touch points where council may have to uh, make decisions. For instance, uh, this year, um, uh, the the tenders for the Oak Bay Rec Center roof came in quite high due to economic conditions, and we had to ask council, are you comfortable spending that money? So we were able to foresee those variances and, and ask for council direction when necessary. Uh, so I would say that's not as common for uh, a municipality of our size. Um, you may be asking yourself, well, where's quarter one and where's quarter four? Uh, quarter one, we're in the middle of budget deliberations, so, um, not a ton of value that would come from that. So we're we're doing a risk. We're doing a, um, you know, we're we're weighing that whether or not it would provide value. Quarter four uh, is taken care of with your full year financial statements. So, Patterson. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Payne. Could I'm wondering if you could just comment? There are municipalities that actually uh, do their budget earlier. And so they do report out on first quarter. I don't know if that's dependent upon perhaps the magnitude of their budgets or not. Perhaps you could just comment on that. Uh, through your worship, a, a good question. And I actually think that that question is going to be better answered when we talk about financial planning, because it's a common question. Um, 
which folks around the table might have, we're going to start budget deliberations in the second month or third month of 2023. So why are we doing budget deliberations in the year that we're budgeting for is, is a common question. Um, and there's good reasons for that. Uh, some municipalities have elected to do the budgeting early on, and that's a, that's a decision council can make. I, I would uh, I'd be able to provide the pros and cons of that. So that frees up the, the uh, capacity for them to do it at that point. It becomes more relevant. Um, there's also some municipalities that do uh, triannual uh, reporting as opposed to quarterly. So they'll do three quarterly updates per year. I think the, the objective of all of it, whatever model you choose, is to provide timely and relevant financial information so council can make decisions when necessary. And you know, one of the major um, reasons why we do quarterly budget reporting is if we foresee that overspending is necessary that would require a financial plan bylaw amendment, we can ask council in advance. Um, otherwise, that spending is not legally allowed to occur. Um, so certainly in quarter one, you're not gonna foresee overspending or you're definitely not gonna need to amend the financial plan bylaw at that point. So it becomes less relevant to do it at that point. Um, but also, you know, some councils want to really keep their, their eye on the operations as well, and the financial reporting provides uh, a glimpse into the, f the operations of the district as a whole. So, Watson? Sorry about that. Thank you, uh, Mayor Murdoch. A couple of questions, just rolling back up the bullet points in your report. One, just quickly about the annual report. Am I correct in thinking that it can contain anything we want, but it must include the financial report. So it would be the financial report plus, plus. Is that right? That's my first question. Uh, through your worship, yeah, there are some minimum components in addition to the financial statements, reporting on permissive tax exemptions and a few other things. But in the spirit of your question, yes, you can have the annual report report on plenty of things uh, in addition to the minimum requirements. And then secondly, please, just with respect to the sustainable procurement policy. Um, I just, we were at an event last week where the notion of making sure our procurement policies would be broadly uh, addressing the needs of First Nations communities to have access to projects that were uh, paid for by municipal governments. Would this be something that would be touched on in a policy like this? Yeah. Mr. Payne? Pardon me, through your worship. Yes, absolutely. In, in fact, I believe the Senate Council has, uh, has forwarded, for instance, protocols for um, um, uh, that talk on pro uh, that talk about procurement. Uh, so the so the um, sustainable procurement policy is really where Council integrates its vision for purchasing, which would include uh, the values at which we would use uh, to do uh, procurement. So absolutely. Thank you, Councillor Watson. Go ahead, Councillor Patterson. Thank you. Um, Mr. Ping, could you just, um, if I backtrack to the statement of financial information, another question that some municipalities do um, is report out not only on the remuneration that um, members of council are paid by the, the local municipality, but they also record reimbursements for any committee work where there's remuneration also. That typically hasn't formed part of um, th this district's reporting. Is there um, any recommendation or plan to change that? Mr. Bain? Uh, through your worship, um, it depends if you could clarify the question. I, you know, I, when I think of a place like the Capital Regional District, where there's a, a, a plethora of committees that one would serve on, and they're entitled to uh, receive remuneration for for being on those, but you're still working for the one entity. You're still receiving remuneration from the one entity, and thus you're required to report all the remuneration from all the committees fr earned from that one entity. Um, it would be unlikely that we would report on. Uh, the remuneration that, uh, let's say, Mayor Murdoch earned from chairing the uh, capital housing, re capital regional housing district, because it's a different entity, and we're and the statement of financial information really uh, focuses on how much remuneration you are earning from the reporting entity, which is the district. Thank you. It's the hospital district, not the oh. housing corporation, but that's okay. Right. Uh, go ahead. Thank you. 
Okay, moving on to the next slide then. Uh, so some uh, other leading practices in the financial uh, framework that's in place at the moment. Uh, Council adopted a, a department transfer policy and that largely encapsulate budget best practices, inter-period budget best practices that um, many uh, CFOs already undertake, but they have never put into a formal policy. And this way, it was it, we were able to sort of test the comfort of council in terms of staff uh, having flexibility in use, utilizing their budget. So, for instance, we might have a, uh, a capital uh, a capital budget that says we've got four or five different capital projects. Maybe one of those projects is under budget. Maybe one of them is over project, over budget. Well, budget best practices is uh, department managers can use those variances to deliver both projects. As long as we're underspending overall, uh, it, uh, with other limitations, uh, then that's that's okay. Um, but we never had that in writing, so we developed the develop the transfer uh, the department transfer policy, and it kind of encapsulates council's expectations with respect to reporting and spending, uh, with within certain limitations. Uh, so that was that was novel in 2022. Uh, we also uh, uh, write our budget to the GFOE Distinguished Budget Award standard, which is it's uh, now becoming more common in in smaller local governments. Used to be used to be only. Um, larger governments that could provide the capacity to prepare that. When we talk about our financial plan later on, I'll distinguish the difference between our financial plan bylaw and our financial plan document. They sound very similar, uh, but the financial plan document is a transparent document that really details our budget, and it meets the, uh, the principles and requirements of this uh, award category. Similarly, the district achieves the Canadian Award for Financial Reporting uh, every year, and that's for its annual report. It's a little bit misleading. They call it a, uh, a, an award for financial reporting, but the requirements of that program really encapsulate what's in your annual report, which is much more than just financial reporting. And so, um, you know, I mentioned this later, the Corporate Services Department leads that effort, and, uh, and they're um, uh, and they so they watch the requirements of that uh, award program very carefully. We have a, reser uh, a reserves and surplus policy. We've been improving that year by year. Um, uh, I think actually we just amended it to include language about the major crimes reserve, for instance. The reserves and surplus policy mainly has been a uh, uh, breadcrumb trail uh, that provides some insight into our reserves. Uh, but lately we've actually been integrating language into there that clarifies the use and intention of some reserves. Um, and so we'll talk about this later on. For instance, council has provided direction to staff to start allocating budget surplus in a certain way, and we're going to develop a policy to integrate into that uh, that encapsulates council vision in that regard. Oh, so that's Green. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Payne, on surpluses and uh, and reserves. What is the process to create a new reserve fund? Just quickly, um, br briefly, I, I, I don't think I've ever been part of a decision like that, but can you just really quickly uh, d describe the process involved? Thank you. Uh, through your worship, absolutely. You just need to tell us. <laughs> just need to, so we'll talk about it later, but there's a, there's a number of ways to, to establish reserves. Just a motion is one. That's the easiest. Uh, you can also put it in a bylaw as well. Thank you. Mr. Payne does go very quickly. He probably does this in his sleep. So, But uh, if we're just backtracking to the surplus um, policy, there are, um, and reserves, there are restricted and unrestricted reserves. Perhaps you'd like to just step back and give us a few words about those. Payne? Absolutely. Thank you. Through your worship. Uh, so the reserves can be restricted in a couple different ways. They can be internally restricted by council passing a resolution saying you've got this money, set it aside for this. Or a council can restrict it by passing a bylaw, moving money into that reserve and saying it can only be used for this. Or it can be externally restricted. So the province can give us money for a grant and say you have to use it for climate 
activity, climate change activities or what have you, that's an externally restricted uh, reserve as well. So there's a couple different ways. There's also, you know, uh, administratively, I can restrict it uh, in conversation with the CAO, but that can always be overruled by council at any point. So, it, you know, um, it's just incumbent on us to make sure that we report those restrictions to you at any point. Thank you. I, I just want to point out uh, from a council perspective on the uh, financial report and the annual report, one of the things that came about uh, that I, I recall that council really did have some feedback on was a, a few years ago we decided to set um, standardized metrics so that the, the annual report would be this, would be measured the same every year uh, so that it wouldn't, didn't become a political decision about what to put in and what to leave out. Uh, so the good and the bad would all be reported equally at any given year. Um, but that is a decision that council makes, so we probably at some point every couple of years need to kind of look at those and make sure there might be some new metrics uh, that come out. We may have access to new information. It was certainly a, a decision-making point at that time about what we could, you know, be, it was reasonable to gather. It wasn't a, a largely onerous task to get certain information, and uh, and and also that was meaningful to the, both the council and the and the residents. Uh, for decision making and for information purposes, so just that's one point I can think of that that kind of came back to the council table to say, here's some here's some reasonable metrics. Thank you, uh, and we have a debt management policy underway. Uh, council uh, resolved uh, to have a debt management. Uh, 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 prepared and and we anticipate to have that before council for consideration uh, by quarter one of uh, next year as well and, uh, and that's that's timely considering some of the information that we'll get to in the rest of the presentation in regards to our reserve forecasts and our infrastructure replacement and the financial uh, a burden that results from that uh, and lastly, we've prepared a sustainable infrastructure replacement plan, which is really a long-term financial plan in the context of asset management, uh, which was the recipient of an award. And it meets uh, International Infrastructure Financial Management Manual best practices. So. Watson. Thank you, Mayor Murdoch. Uh, Mr. Payne, just because I am a newcomer here, could you just say a couple of things about the debt management policy and the... The, the kind of a large arc of what it would include. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, through your worship. Uh, so debt management policy, I mean, first of all, we have some statutory guidelines for when and when we cannot take on debt. However, council, uh, uh, you know, it's incumbent on council to provide their vision for what's appropriate use of debt. Um, for instance, uh, council, you, you may have a community that, uh, uh, is very fiscally conservative and, and debt uh, shouldn't be considered and they want that in, in the debt policy. Or uh, you, you may be in a situation where your forecasts indicate that you need debt, so you need to provide um, some guidelines of when that becomes appropriate and what type of expenditures and how to prioritize debt over reserves in what situations. So those are, those are there's, there's more parameters, and, uh, um, but those are the, uh, the main ones I can think of right away. Go ahead, Councilor Director Payne. So now we're going to just talk about budget, uh, 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 and then we'll get into some of the other topics that we we've discussed so far. So just to talk about the timeline here, generally what we what we do is we ask for departments to provide any budget updates by October 31st. So if they have any major changes to the five-year financial plan, I need to know by October 31st. Uh, and then from that point forward, so basically right now, the finance department is putting together uh, the draft consolidated budget, so the whole budget uh, first draft. I usually take a little break for some Christmas there. <laughs> and then in February, uh, generally, that's when the first draft of the entire budget is published in time for the first committee of the whole meeting, uh, at least the budget deliberation committee of the whole. Now this timeline might be bumped a little bit this year because uh, council's still uh, working on strategic planning, understandably. Generally, uh, we've done a really good job here of uh, having strategic planning and refinements done before the end of the year. And, uh, and, and thus all the financial implications of that can be easily be integrated. Uh, but we're giving ourselves a little bit of contingency room this year in case there's some last minute changes or direction from council, we can integrate it into the first draft of the financial plan. Uh, and then so we work through uh, February and into the beginning of March uh, normally. Uh, budget deliberations, there's usually a series of four meetings. Uh, the last 
the last budget meeting that we did last year uh, was it was quite quick actually because we had refined, 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 uh, and then. But I expect this year we're, we're going to have a renewed uh, vision, and so we'll we'll put together that financial plan and we'll refine through the council term. Absolutely. And then uh, April and May is when the financial plan uh, bylaws adopted. The financial plan must be adopted by legislation uh, by May 14th, and. I just, but I just want to help council work that backwards a, a bit because it's not as generous as that sounds. Uh, the financial plan bylaw, since it is a bylaw, needs to be adopted in two meetings. Uh, so generally, that means you, at the very last moment, you uh, you you give a first, second, and third reading in the very last meeting in April. Um, generally, I like to have one meeting buffer there in case there's there's uh, there's changes. So that would mean the beginning of April. And then with the agenda deadline, uh, that would mean the end of March. So all, all of a sudden, to meet the May 14th deadline, we're, we're in March. Now, that doesn't mean we can't pivot if we need to pivot for council. We can have special council meeting if we need to do first, second, third reading. Or we can use up that buffer meeting that we do. So it's possible for there, for sure. Um, but that's generally why we like to wrap up um, the bulk of budget uh, discussions uh, in March. And I will just say, uh, in my philosophy anyways, and, and you can overrule my philosophy at any time, I think that the budget uh, is actually a product of all the decisions council has made throughout the year. It's not where those decisions are generally made. Now, council has to put uh, money to paper for the decisions that they've made throughout the year, uh, but generally there's no, there should be no surprises in there. You've given us direction at any point during the year, and we've, uh, we've integrated those uh, financial implications into, into the to the budget. And when you're making those decisions, you should have the financial implications before you. So again, those that shouldn't be a, a surprise to you at that time. Only thing that may surprise you is the economic factors that are completely out of your control, like 6.9% inflation and what have you. <laughs> so so I, I like to say that's not necessarily where we're, where we're making decisions, but sometimes it is a good point uh, at making decisions. Sometimes we get recommendations uh, from a committee or what have you that uh, that are that are that coincide with uh, the financial plan process. So some of the principles that we abide by again, these principles are not uh, uh, cemented in uh, 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 legislation or what have you. Uh, they're 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 best practices. They are outlined in our financial plan document, so they're out there for the public to see how we abide by. Uh, the first, and, and I would I would. I would say the most important principle, uh, which does differ from other municipalities, some, some, some also use this principle, is the service level approach. And basically what it means is that governance is governance, operations is operations. It means council gets to choose what services are provided to its citizens and operations get to implement that. And so essentially we would prepare the financial plan under the assumption that council would like to continue with the existing service levels unless you say differently. And if you want to increase service levels, we integrate the uh, increased cost of that. If you want to reduce service levels, that's the same thing. There might be some regulatory minimums at service levels that we need to meet, uh, so we'll do that. Otherwise, if council instead, the other way is to have a financial target. Council says, we would like to have a 4% tax increase. Chris, go find a way. If you do that, which you can, absolutely, then you're putting your leadership team in the position to make the service level decisions for you. And, they, and we will go and prioritize the best use of money to deliver the services, to reduce the services as least as possible. Um, but really, you know, I would say that's a governance, um, that's a governance role, it, it is determining what, uh, and balancing and prioritizing the services of the community. Now, we do have established some service levels specifically. Others are implied. You know, in an ideal world, when you're just about to incorporate the first municipality, the first thing you would do is uh, establish exactly the service level expectations for everything you're about to provide. And then you would establish the cost of it, and then you would tax for the cost of it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, communities evolve, and, the, and, uh, and there's very few communities that have established very specific service levels. But you have a feel for whether service levels are slipping or not, and, and you will let us know. But it's always our intent to maintain existing service levels, not let them slip, and, and come to you for consent if we want to reduce them. So for instance, during the pandemic, um, I believe we uh, reduced the garden waste service at the public works yard uh, for various logistical reasons. And 
council consented to that. So that's an example of, of seeking, seeking your direction. The second and, and also very important principle is it's, it is a five-year expenditure authorization in the financial plan. So we've prepared what we believe is a true five-year financial plan that accomplishes council's vision in that five years. Uh, assuming, of course, that it all gets spent and the other things. But, it, but the five-year expenditure authorization is the money required to, to achieve council's vision. Uh, and so we, um, we like to repeat uh, very much that you're not budgeting just for this year, you're budgeting for all four years, and that authorization does carry, carry over so that your staff can't spend money without a financial plan bylaw in place. Come January 1st, 2023, we still have authority to spend pursuant to the 2022 bylaw. Uh, and so uh, otherwise we would have to stop paying staff on January 1st, right? So that extends to capital services and it really does, um, uh, it really does speed up the efficiency of, of uh, delivering council's vision. So if for instance, we know January 1st, council said, go ahead and rebuild the roof, uh, we can be tendering it in October of the prior year, and we have it ready to go January 1st. We don't have to wait for the new financial plan bylaw to be adopted. And we take it at your word. We take you at your word that what you said to do in the financial plan, you want to continue to do that. Uh, but you always have the option at any point to say, no, please don't do that, actually. Any point in the year. You don't have to wait until we're refining the budget. Uh, so um, that really that really keeps things moving. And unfortunately, uh, I hope none of my CFO colleagues are watching. Unfortunately, the industry has a habit of CFOs saying, oh, no, wait till the budget's approved. And well, we've, we've, we've approved five years of budget, so you don't need to wait. Um, so that's important. Oh, yeah. Kelsey Watson. Thank you. Uh, yes, Director Payne, just a question about that five-year process. So um, would it be fair to say it's kind of it's like a five-year rolling project is that right and if so how accurate or reliable would be the information that's included in say year three four and five yeah, yeah excellent question i would say uh, in terms of the accuracy of the later years in the financial plan uh, operations is pretty predictable uh, capital is not yeah, and capital is always ambitious. Capital is all, you know, we've always got $20 million in capital and we end up spending eight or 10. <laughs> and every year we're, 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 we're spending more and more capital, but uh, capital is always ambitious. And, and I think it's because folks want to make sure they have the funds in place to do it if they can do it, and then capacity constraints occur. Uh, and also priorities change, you know, the, the district, uh, uh, the districts, well, I'll just say asset management maturity is, is improving significantly, which changes how we prioritize things. Uh, a couple of years ago, we, we didn't, uh, you know, we had um, a facilities plan, but now we've got a new iteration of that facilities plan, which reestablishes priority. So it, it does change um, considerably. Councillor Patterson. Thank you. Thank you, Director Payne. Just a question. Um, in this district, historically, both the capital and operation budgets for the district's assets have been underfunded. So what tools or assessment data do staff use to develop sustainable service delivery framework in the absence of district historical data? Mr. Payne. Uh, yes, thank you, Your Worship. Well, the first step was, I, I think, uh, was producing the SIR plan, which was, was able to demonstrate the, um, uh, the age of our infrastructure and how that compares to national standards, standards in terms of, of infrastructure and how, and how things have been compressed into a short time frame to, to, to uh, um, sustain. Now, there are other um, uh, metrics that really need to be developed. Um, uh, we'll talk about it a little bit later on, uh, and I'm focusing on asset management here, but your question really can pertain to not just assets, right? Um, you know, we'd love to procure uh, asset management sof software which integrates condition assessments alongside master plans, alongside replacement values, and then can optimize our capital plan, for instance. So that's how you would, you would measure um, you'd be able to measure capital output. And that's something that, uh, admittedly, we have lacked uh, a ton of um, uh, complexity to. So, you, you know, you want to know, 
if we've got 140 kilometers of storming, how much of that is being replaced? If we're supposed to be replacing it 80 years, we should be doing more than one or two kilometers of that per year. So that sort of asset management data helps decision making and also helps with performance measurement. I intend to, in, 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 in terms of um, operating uh, performance, uh, uh, you know, I think there's um, Im improvement available for establishing service levels. And I think that the, the, the district has um, seen improvement of this over the last number of years. And it's not just about output measures, but also determining quality measures. So for instance, I, I always use development services as, a, as an example. We can report to council how many development variance permits we've done every year, but that doesn't necessarily indicate the timeliness of those, of those development permits. So if we can establish performance measures to do that, uh, then it, it's more accurate for our, uh, for our performance measuring. Thank you. Continue. So, you know, I think this is actually a good, a good point to address some of the questions early on about uh, some, you know, some municipalities have chosen to budget earlier and whether or not that has value. And you can, you can decide whether or not it has value. Now, there's a number of pieces of legislation that work together for local governments. We've got, for instance, the Assessment Authority Act, which outlines when we will get information from BC Assessment with respect to our, uh, our housing prices. Uh, and they 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 don't provide us with, for instance, our uh, our role our, our role until March. So we won't know our non-market change revenue, which is a piece in there. Uh, we've got, for instance, the Greater Victoria Public Library budget. That's not uh, doesn't need to be approved till May. Uh, the police board does a, a a budget in November, but they can refine it in March. Um, the Capital Regional District doesn't have to approve their budget until. March. So there's a whole bunch of uh, pieces that are inputs into our financial plan that don't show up until the next year, anyways. So, so that's that's number one. But the the other the other piece to it again is it really is a refining of last year's budget. It's really not redoing the whole budget. And I think we transformed that here in in the district over the last decade or so, where initially we would build the budget from the very ground up every single year, which was exhausting and, and exhaustive, and instead taking the whole package and refining it according to changing council priorities. Uh, and I think that's the way to go. So um, so most of the budget is there. It just needs to be tweaked according to what you know council, um, council priorities have changed. Uh, the other principle in here is funding source alignment. Um, so essentially what this means is that we're trying to align uh, ongoing expenditures with ongoing sustainable revenues. So for instance, you know, your staff that are providing corporate services, uh, it's, it's a core service in municipalities. It's always going to be there. So you need to fund those salaries with ongoing revenues, such as taxes, right? Or we're always going to need to provide water, water to our citizens. So we should fund that with an ongoing revenue, such as a water utility. Um, but it would be inappropriate to pay for staffing using reserve funds, which are finite, right? They're one-year balance. Um, and, you know, we've seen that in some local governments and um, not passing any judgment, but if you use surplus funds to fund ongoing operating expenditures, you're going to have to make up for that difference with tax increases in the future anyways. Uh, so it's not uh, normally advisable. Um, and then on the flip side, you have some expenditures that are infrequent, one time, or um, uh, or quite um, variable. So you might want to go and uh, replace your protective services building, for instance, for I don't know, fifteen to twenty million dollars. You're not going to fund that with a tax increase in one year, right? That would be. Uh, a 50% tax increase or a 75% tax increase. You're going to save for that gradually over the life of, of that building, um, and then you're going to fund that with reserves, so one time from reserves. So you're aligning one time or infrequent expenditures with a finite funding source. Uh, the next principle uh, in the, our financial planning process is our life cycle costing. Um, and this essentially makes sure that staff are providing counsel with the full life cycle costs when they're making capital expenditure decisions, uh, especially for new capital services. So you may have uh, a road, for instance. You've always had that road. You have to maintain that road, sweep that road. 
um, crack sealing, all, all that sort of stuff. That's all integrated into your operating budget. So, um, but if you want to build a new road that doesn't exist before, you want to build a new rec center that doesn't exist, the decision isn't really just the capital construction, it's also the ongoing operating expenses that you're imposing on the community thereafter, right? So I always use the Carnarvon building as an example. When estimates were first provided for that building a number of years ago in the Carnarvon Park Master Plan, uh, construction was estimated to be $5 million, but we presented council with the full life cycle costing of that. Closer to $21 million really is what you're going to spend on that building over the, over its life cycle, and that imposes basically a three-quarter of a percent tax increase. So that's the sort of information that ha is decision useful, right? And we've got this concept called non-market change. It's not an intuitive uh, title, and I've used different terms for it new construction taxation revenue, new development taxation revenue. Everything is confusing. I haven't been able to find the best term for it. But So let me try to describe what non-market change revenue is and, and what we use, use it for. Suppose, for instance, you've got a lot that is vacant. There's no building on that lot, and, uh, and you build a building on that lot this year. So last year, we didn't get any taxes from that building because it never existed. This year, we get taxes from that building now and forever. And that's the, the model. That's non-market change revenue. And, and what it means is that you've got more tax base that didn't exist previously. Uh, many local governments, they take that money and they reduce the tax burden to existing taxpayers because it's something easy to do. But in reality, what happens is when a new building is built, more citizens move in, there's more use of our protective services, there's more use of our corporate services, there's more use of our infrastructure. So with a new building, there's new costs that are associated with it. But those costs, um, they're always trailing the new revenue. It will get new revenue as soon as you rezone it. We'll get new revenue as soon as it gets subdivided. We'll get new revenue as soon as there's a skeleton of a building there. And we can pocket that. Um, but the costs are when people move in and start using your services and the infrastructure that they use start wearing down. So it's a mistiming of the revenue and the cost that they impose. So what I suggest, the principled approach to it is to not use that, that, re that new revenue to offset existing expenses, but put it aside in a reserve. And since we have a funding gap with respect to our infrastructure, we've been putting it in the infrastructure reserve, but that revenue can be used to fund uh, increasing s services or maintain existing service levels. See, there's a question. Councillor Watson? Uh, yeah, just right on this topic, um, uh, a question that often comes up in the community or an observation in the community when we were considering secondary suites was, you know, all these new, this imposition on our service levels. Would it be true to say then, just based on what you're saying, that as we see new suites developed and, if, and the assessment authority catches up with that through building permit information, that we'll see the revenue, but it'll be, and you will put that aside? In a, is that what you're planning to do for those secondary suites adjustments to our property tax revenue? Go ahead, Mr. Payne. So with respect to secondary suites, Specifically, Now, your question can pertain to other types of development, but secondary suites specifically would be a, actually a market change. So when BC Assessment looks at a property, they say, well, the property is worth an extra $20,000 because it has a suite, uh, and you've legalized it. Uh, but that's, that's a market value. It's not new stock. Yeah. But when, you're, when you are uh, demolishing a single-family dwelling and putting up a multifamily dwelling there, that's new, new market for sure. Thank you. Councillor Appleton. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you to Mr. Payne. Um, with respect, thank you, Mr. Payne. With respect to non-market change, it's, it's fair to say that with the current, just the current layout of the community and the current the current state of things, it's there's not a great deal that doesn't represent a, 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 a very high percentage of the budget overall at this stage of the game. So. I would make I, I would ask your comments about you know if that number reached a certain threshold as in if it right right at the moment it's not a marginal percentage it's a relatively small percentage in the grand scheme of things in the budget if it reached a certain level it would certainly bear revisiting as far as how it was applied Mr. Payne uh, through your worship yes absolutely and and you know we've just chosen 
the infrastructure gap as, as its recipient. But if you, for instance, were a growing community like Colwood or Langford and you're seeing 10,000 new residents over the next 10 years and you're going to need a new protective services building, you, you might want to use it strategically to fund the creation of new firefighters. Uh, and, and so that might be prudent. Um, or you might be in a situation where you're built out and now you're starting to see the economies of scale of, of development uh, where you can service property with the same amount of infrastructure. So the new revenue exceeds the new cost. Maybe you use it strategically. City of Victoria, for instance, they'll use their non-market change strategically for all sorts of things. Um, so absolutely, it, it, it can be re revisited any time. And in terms of magnitude, right now, it's usually around a third of a percent of a tax increase. So when we're passing, you know, when we're passing tax rates, 5%, it doesn't represent a, a much of a difference or an opportunity to reduce the financial burden to folks anyways. Thank you for that, Mr. Payne. Great. Okay, and then the next principle is the, our transparency. Again, the minimum requirement for uh, financial planning is to do the financial plan bylaw. But if you, if you, you know, want to torture yourself to go read the financial plan bylaw, it's at a very high level. I think we've got protective services, general government, water and sewer, and that's, you know, $40 million. Uh, so if I was a taxpayer, I'd say, well, that's not good enough. I kind of want to know what's going on, right? And so we prepare the financial plan document, and that's, you know, over 100 pages, usually 130 pages, and that provides the transparency that we need. Okay, so we kind of covered this question. Why do we, why do we budget in 2023 for 2023? Yep, I've answered that. The next common question uh, from from can, can I just yes inter sorry yeah. Mr. Payne uh, I'm just going to interrupt just again for clarity because this does represent a significant change from how things were done in, in the past so the five year financial plan now really does so when we're going through we go through strategic planning and priorities you'll see that you know some projects might start in 2023 some in 2024 some in 2025 and we kind of map out all of those things over the years uh, and so it's. It is actually is a fair bit of attention paid to that that document over the five year plan. Yes, it gets less accurate going out, but uh, the planning process aligns with that, and that was that's completely new. <clears throat> but it's also really important for us that we look at it that carefully because it also, as the asset management and other aspects come forward, uh, the more we can sort of pre anticipate and pre book it, that financial plan gives you authorization for them to go do that work, and they can start doing multi year procurement and those sorts of things, which can again help drive down costs. So. Um, that shift, again, fairly recent, has been a really critical one to allow us to do better financial uh, processes. Thank you, Worship. And if I could add one more thing as well, because uncertainty in the budget is an issue, uh, and, and but council used the budget as a as a tool to inform council what's happening and what's and what we're looking at in the future. So there are no surprises, and you can prioritize with the big picture in mind. And, you know, for instance, this year, I, I know the volatility of prices and certain things are, uh, they're, they're just very volatile. So there's some products that we think we know we need to replace in four or five years. I'm not really comfortable putting in a price tag there yet, but I'm going to use the financial plan as a opportunity to highlight we're going to fill this square in at some point, Council, it's happening. Um, so you know something's, you know, to expect something. Uh, but there is a level of um, of quality that we want to integrate into the financial plan as well. So we don't, we, we don't put in numbers that are low quality because they set expectations in the community as well. One of the things that we'll, we'll talk about it later as well that we could, we could do to improve our budget is establish... Uh, 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 a minimum expectation for budget quality um, um, you know, when we're preparing estimates um, because they're all of the map. Sometimes you'll see estimates here that are class D, class C, um, and then you'll and then in other areas you'll see um, uh, conceptual estimates which are which are much much less um, accurate. And we need to be able to articulate in the financial plan because otherwise it, it forms expectations in the community. You know, an example is a playground uh, where council in the community can do so much when replacing a playground. It can look so different than before. So it can be a $50,000 project or a 250000 but there's so much depending on direction. So, Go ahead, Councillor Watson. 
Thank you. Uh, just to follow up on that point, Director Payne, so therefore, in the budget right now, do those get footnoted in terms of the quality of the estimate in some way so you can see the relationship between a rough estimate and a more accurate estimate? Uh, through your worship, uh, no. Um, you know, generally what, what I do is uh, just demand a lot more contingency for the things that are less quality. Um, and uh, um, for, for the significant projects, uh, we 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 uphold a high standard for for quality when when we're nearing it in the financial plan for sure. If we have a very significant project that is um, low quality estimate, we will flag it. But there's a lot of things that will go unflagged and 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 we'll have contingency. Thank you. Go, uh, go ahead, Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Director Payne, could you clarify at what point in time you actually would insert the life cycle cost for planned capital, say, building um, into the five-year plan? Mr. Payne? Uh, yes, thank you. Excellent question. Um, so, first of all, we will report on the life cycle cost of capital decisions only in the case where there's incremental change. So if we are increasing the service level, it's a new capital service, that's when you would get um, detail of the life cycle cost. But, I, but to your question, I believe, uh, okay, so council's made the decision to build a new building that didn't exist before. Where does the operating impact of that show up in the financial plan? Now we did have a kind of a line item in the in a tax uh, increase summary, and in there it showed operating impacts of capital decisions. Now, I didn't. I, I actually took it away from the last financial plan because it was so insignificant. It was like 0.12 percent or something like that. Um, but it's it's something we can absolutely produce, and, and especially if council is making uh, decisions that have significant operating impacts, then we should articulate it in the in the tax summary uh, section. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, how do things get in appear in the budget? Um, uh, uh, I think the key here is that you know we're integrating council direction, uh, and so not not individual council direction. Uh, it's not about how many hints you give me about something you want in there. Not that anyone has ever done that, um, but you know we take that lens seriously at the leadership level as well. Does this reflect council decision? Uh, are we proposing to council that they change their priorities? Are we proposing to council that? we think you should have different service levels. If that's the case, we need to make that clear. Um, but we won't articulate it into the draft financial plan uh, unless it's specific direction from council. Now that does take some interpretation, right? Uh, council will adopt, uh, council will provide specific direction or maybe sometimes council will adopt a master plan or endorse a plan that then uh, we need to interpret uh, uh, how we enact that pursuant to the financial plan bylaw. So an existent, so a, a, an example would be the urban forest management plan. Um, that was actually a good example because in that plan it outlined what it, in, it what it thought would be the financial implications of those decisions. Council endorsed that plan and we integrated it into the financial plan. But not every plan is as good as producing those financial implications. We really do endeavor, you know, uh, uh, here that before a plan is brought to council for consideration, that it includes the financial implications of that. So there should be no surprise. But we sometimes we have to, we really have to um, interpret direction related to service levels and we put it in there. Uh, and then of course there's regulatory minimums that we have to meet. So, you know, one of the cost drivers in our budget uh, lately has been WorkSafe BC premiums, which, you know, what that premium pays for has changed significantly over the last five years. The coverage has been expanded and but we're required to provide WorkSafe BC uh, coverage to our employees so we put it in there without without asking your permission basically. Uh, and the next common question, how does the police budget uh, process differ from, from the remaining? And for the purposes of our financial planning, I would say that the police budget is really kind of treated as an external uh, request. It's not exactly an external request, but it is um, a request from the board, right? It's not produced by internal staff. And so uh, we were required to get a request from the board uh, in November. So you'll actually see that on the next uh, council meeting. And council can choose to do a couple things with that request. You can fund it, which this council has uh, historically done. 
Um, you could ask the police board to revise it uh, for whatever reason. You could say, oh, we're not, you know, I, I don't know what reason you would say, oh, we're not quite sure your estimates are accurate, or, or perhaps uh, we want you to reduce the financial burden. Is there any services you can trim? You can ask the police board to go back. And if you do that, the police board, they can make revisions, or if they, if they have a, a statutory duty to provide uh, for community safety. So if they believe that what you're asking of them compromises that statutory requirement, then they can be able to appeal to the province for adjudication. Uh, historically, um, uh, uh, the council has, uh, has approved the uh, budget request, and we haven't. They have an opportunity to amend their budget request in the new year if there's any changes between then. I haven't seen any of any such changes um, since I've uh, worked for the district, so it's been consistent from the November request. D did you want to add anything to that, uh, to that mayor, to that mayor? I, I think you covered it pretty well on that one. There's a. Uh... It's a it, Oak Bay has a fairly straightforward police department. There's not, uh, and you, like some some of the departments have a much wider variety of, of services and pieces. The the service contracts tend to keep things pretty steady. Um, most of the cost changes at that at the police board level of late have come from, again from external asks. So uh, things like ecom and other uh, third party bodies that provide services or have changed their costing models, and that tends to be the the variation in the in the costing. Okay, now we'll talk about reserves a little bit. So the question is, well, what are reserves? And, and simply put, it's just money set aside for a separate purpose, a specific purpose. Um, you know, technically speaking, if you want to uh, split hairs, reserve funds are different than reserves, but you really don't need to know unless you want to know. <laughs> um, so how are reserves created? Uh, the common the common way that they're created is through bylaw. We have a uh, consolidated re reserve bylaw. Uh, it's on our website under the policies and bylaws section, and it outlines a number of uh, reserves there and what their specific purpose must be. Um, you can create reserves by financial plan bylaw. The financial plan bylaw is direction to staff, and in that in that you could provide direction to set aside money for for a purpose. So interesting fact. Our infrastructure renewal reserve was created by financial plan bylaw. It's not in our reserve plan bylaw. There's no council resolution. Um, so technically, that's actually rather unrestricted. Uh, intuitive to its name, staff are spending it only on infrastructure. Um, but council could ask that we use the infrastructure renewal reserve for whatever you want, really. And we would say, are you sure? You know, you you sure you don't want it for infrastructure? Um, but you could also tighten that up if you wanted by asking us to put it in a bylaw. Uh, council can um, can repeal a bylaw, so you have that authority as well. There are some statutory limitations. If you came into monies through capital purposes, you must use them for capital purposes. So if you sell a piece of land, you have to use that those funds uh, to repay the debt on that land or for other capital purposes. If you can demonstrate to the province that you don't need it for those purposes, they can allow you to repurpose it elsewhere. Uh, we got lots of capital purposes, so that'll be a, a stretch. Sorry, go ahead, Councillor Patterson. Sorry, I did want I did want to recognize the mayor, not just go to, directly to Director Payne. Just um, on the on the reserves. And it really, I, what I want to talk about is um, expectations of the, of the community. So uh, certainly, when we embarked on our new financial sustainable model for plan, there was a reach out to the community about their willingness to contribute extra in taxes in order to fund things like infrastructure. Um, and uh, those questions were were um, asked of the community via survey, and the feedback came in. So, in your in the comments that you made about uh, council having the discretion to perhaps use the reserve funds for other than the, those intended purposes, um, I would think then that that would may have negative consequences on um, the expectations and, and feedback from the community. But could you perhaps just also talk about the the fairness in 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 that? Because if 
as most of us being residents here, we all we all contribute to the tax base. And so um, if the funding is not actually used for by a council for the stated uh, purpose for which it's collected, what type of reporting is done back to residents in the community? Mr. Payne. Uh, through your worship. So I would agree if those funds were used for what it sounds like they should be used for, that could be um, viewed as a, as a betrayal, I, I suppose. Now, what we do in the financial plan to provide transparency is for all of our major um, reserve funds, we uh, forecast their use and for what purpose in the reserve section of our financial plan. So you'll be able to see exactly what's being spent from the Capital Works Reserve and from the Infrastructure Renewal Reserve. But that's not um, mandated by legislation as well. So it's um, it's something that uh, could go by the wayside without council council oversight. I would I would uh, you know personally I would always have that information in there. I think the, the more transparent, uh, the better. Um, the other the other um, ad advantage of having uh, reserve funds uh, encapsulated by a bylaw is that. Um, uh, is that you're required to report those balances in your financial statement in, in one of the, the notes. Uh, we do report the infrastructure renewal reserve um, balance in, in that note as well. So you can, you can see that there's uh, some movement there. Uh, and you're also required to, um, to, rec to record intended use of those reserves in your financial plan bylaw. So I have to show in my financial plan bylaw how much money I intend to move in, how much I intend to move out. So if the infrastructure renewal reserve is encapsulated by a bylaw, it would show up there as well. So there's a couple, there's a couple techniques uh, there um, which can assist the, the community in, in feeling comfortable that those, th those are being used. And I mean, I can just say they have been and they are, <laughs> but I can understand that might not be the, um, uh, that might not be good enough for some residents, to, to be honest. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Payne. Yeah. Okay, uh, and then a couple other ways that a reserves can be created. Again, council resolution. Council can just say we've set aside money here, and unless you know uh, staff come back to you and and persuade you to um, to uh, rescind that resolution, we have to abide by that for sure. And then the last and, and less common again is administrative judgment. Um, prior to 2019, um, prior to 2020, um, there was a lot of uh, um, restricting of reserves using administrative judgment um, through the C CAO. Um, and so funds were set aside for certain projects in our operating fund. Um, but at any point, council can take those funds and use them for their purposes. We don't do that anymore. Um, we, from 2020 to, through to 2021, we never uh, apportioned our surplus anywhere. So it just accumulated in a general fund. Uh, and then we came to council in May of last year and said, how would you guys like to allocate this? Here we have some suggestions. Council ultimately took those recommendations and then they directed that staff prepare a surplus allocation policy. And I do believe best practices is to have council decide on, on uh, surplus uh, priorities and have it done in a, in a transparent process. And lastly, there can be an external restrictions. Um, uh, not, you know, one common external restrictions would be uh, developer cost charges, which is uh, externally restricted by the Local Government Act, so you've got to report it separately. Or if you get a grant from the province uh, that says it must be used for X, Y, Z, there's an external restriction, and that's considered a reserve. Okay. So I didn't have time to um, bring all of our reserves up to balance for this meeting, and, and Council will see the forecasted year-end balances are reserves in the budget deliberations coming up in a couple months. But this, for instance, was what I provided council with at the beginning of budget deliberations last year, about approximately $57 million. You'll see some of the major reserve balances there, our capital works reserves at almost $20 million, our infrastructure renewal reserve at almost $16 million. At the very top, we had this thing called general reserves and surplus. Most of that now has been allocated 
Yeah, everyone's squinting. <laughs> Most of that is is uh, is allocated uh, now. Uh, we did that in May, so that would be much lower, and you'll see a lot more money in our infrastructure renewal reserve, for instance. But we've got all sorts of other other reserves that have um, evolved with the district over time, and I'm happy to you know discuss any of those specifics at any time. I hadn't planned on doing that in this um, presentation, but everyone's squinting, so I, I I'm sensing that someone's going to ask about one of those reserves. Okay. Oh, hey, Councillor Smart. Yeah, through, through you, Mayor. Um, I was wondering if you could um, comment on the capital works and just the scope of that. Yes, thank you. You know, the capital works reserve is a common reserve among uh, among all municipalities. And the reason being is that often we're in receipt of funds that have to be used for capital, so you create a capital works reserve. We have historically used that for um, funding the replacement of much of our infrastructure. So there's a number of transfers that come from our department. So for instance, the Parks, Rec, and Culture Department will have embedded in their budget transfers to that reserve for the replacement of some of their machinery and equipment. Um, however, there's no restriction in that, um, in that reserve in terms of whether you're renewing capital or new capital. So technically, Council could use the full $19 million for brand new capital. Um, rather than renewal. Now, the infrastructure renewal reserve, if you don't mind me talking about that, the name implies it should be for only renewing capital. So that's the difference there. Thank you. Moving on. So I just, I wanted to take, take a bit of time and uh, provide council with the same sort of forecast or modeling that I did at the 2022 financial plan process. And it shows the impact of the infrastructure renewal and what it would have on our, on our reserves. And it also kind of puts, puts it in context for how large our reserves are because $50 million sounds like a lot of money, right? So in, at the beginning of 2022, we had about $40 million that could be used for capital renewal. So this doesn't include all of our capital reserves, just reserves that we thought were set aside specifically for capital renewal. And if the financial plan came to fruition perfectly over the five years, so we spent every dollar on capital as proposed, and no less, no more, we would end up with about $33 million at the end of 2026. And that's with every year putting in between eight and $10 million into those reserves. So we're spending quite a lot. That's it's over $50 million coming out of the reserves. Now, um, if you, now I modeled, well, what if we use our operating surplus as well to renew capital? And, ca and council did take a large chunk of that $11 million that was in our operating surplus and put it into capital. So that projection wasn't, wasn't too far off. So if we did that same sort of trend, you start with 50 million, you'd end up with $43 million, okay? Now, in the financial plan, we also had a couple of projects that we were proposing to be funded by debt. The Carnarvon Park building was one of them. The North Oak Bay uh, consolidation and water main replacement was another one because that was a couple million dollars. Now, supposing that we decided to fund those projects with reserve instead, this is what would happen. So we would be closer to $30 million. So we would drop by about $20 million over the five years. And lastly, and this is this is where the trend, where you'll see the real impact of, of your decisions, hopefully, you know, ca uh, staff were recommending that we increase capital output by 300 to 500% on our core capital, that being storm, sewer, water, and roads. And if we were able to do that, um, this is what would happen to our reserves. Almost all gone, because we have um, so much to do in the short term, so, and we would recommend that we do that in the short term, and if council agrees, we would essentially use all our reserves up. This is the main reason that's holding me back from placing all of our funds in real long term investments, uh, because if we want to accomplish what council says we want to accomplish, which is significant capital renewal, we're going to need to use all of the all of those funds. So I'll also say, you know, there often I, I get the sentiment in the community like, Chris, you, you have uh, access to cheap debt, right? The MFA is an excellent organization. Just take on some debt. We need to get some some capital done. That's really not what's, what's holding us back. You know, we've got 50 million in reserve to do it. 
it's this organization is maturing and scaling up to that challenge, which is, which is a huge challenge. Council just last year in June authorized the hiring of five FTEs in the engine, engineering department. That hasn't taken place. Our director of engineering is now at Esquimalt, and our new director starts on Thursday. So on Friday, I'll expect those positions to be in place. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll get, get going. But the scale of scaling up to that much more capital is significant. That's really um, really the challenge that we're undertaking at the moment. Mr. Patterson. Thank you. Those graphs are so tremendously exciting. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, but very helpful, very helpful. Um, the, the reason, the rationale also um, that you haven't commented on about this because it does speak to capital, but um, the f former director of engineering who is now in Esquimalt um, did make the presentation to council also that without um, accelerating the capital renewal projects, the risk was increasing to the existing infrastructure. And so, of course, we we will end up, you know, really going using up all of our reserve funds. But a failure to do that will also um, drive up the operational budget um, and and unplanned maintenance, which could have uh, much more negative consequences also on the district. Is that correct? Spain, uh, through your worship, that is correct. Um, uh, so a couple comments there. We'll talk about later on in the slides how much infrastructure is overdue for replacement and what does that mean? Well, the infrastructure is still there, it's still working, so what does it mean that it's overdue for replacement? And it really comes down to risk and, the t and how much risk the district wants to take for failure of that infrastructure. Uh, and so we're taking on a greater risk by exceeding those, those useful lives. But the other, the other point um, that Councillor Patterson made is in terms of proactive maintenance versus reactive. And we're in a bit of a false economy right now where our time is spent doing fixes. And Council has done its part um, by increasing funding significantly. So, but the process is, is slow, right? Changing, uh, changing from that reactive state into a proactive state is going to take a long time. And, you know, to it, if we are able to scale up our infrastructure replacement by 300 to 500%, it's still a 25 year journey. Uh, and so getting out of that false economy of spending our time doing reactive and foregoing the proactive, which would save us time and money later on, it's, that's going to take a while to get out of that. Absolutely. Go ahead, Councillor Watson. Um, can I just ask for clarification about this diagram here? Are, the, are these, is this modeling assuming that there would be no debt used to do any of this work? So this is a debt-free model of using the reserve fund to finance these things. And if you could just, um, you had said something about your views or of council's decisions not to use debt. Could you just review that for me, please? Or maybe you're getting to it later in your presentation and I should wait, <laughs> just whatever. <laughs> Mr. Uh, through your worship, uh, that's correct. This this um, yellow line for here it assumes no debt was taken on. Um, the green line assumes a little. The top green line assumed a little bit of debt uh, taken on. In reality, you know, it wouldn't be prudent for our reserves to be zero, which is <laughs> what this models. So we would take on debt at a certain point and maintain a a, a prudent reserve balance uh, thereafter. After. Um, uh, now, I don't think council has really had its chance to talk about how you feel about debt, right? We, we, uh, we'll, cross the, well, we'll cross that bridge when the debt management policy comes before you, but, you know, we've got these reserves to spend. <laughs> so it hasn't, the pressure to use debt hasn't been, or the decision hasn't, hasn't been there, but we'll have that chance. And yes, there is further information about debt uh, coming. Thank you, Mr. Payne. Thank you. That is a scary slide. <laughs> I, you know, I think it, it just puts it into context the magnitude of how much infrastructure we have to replace versus our, our, our reserves because, you know, without seeing that context, members of the public may feel like our reserves are padded. We've got $50 million, but when you've got $900 million in assets, that's a drop in the bucket in terms of how many assets you have. So, And we'll talk about, you know, uh, Council can really provide its vision for what it considers fair, a fair funding model. I'll make the case for a sustainable um, funding model that 
that funds assets over the life of their assets. But that doesn't mean that that's the um, necessarily the view of council. Uh, but it does achieve certain things from a financial perspective and only a financial perspective. So our debt. Green, did you want to? Do you have a question? Through you, Mayor, thank you. Um, Mr. Payne, just for historical context and for my own information, because I've never asked the question, what is Oak Bay's history in terms of debt and debt management? Um, do we have uh, a history that is uh, discouraging, encouraging, or is, or is it something that Oak Bay has avoided to really tackle? Just a question. Thank you. Yeah, and I and I uh, through your worship, I don't know the exact answer, but I I can say confidently that we've had very low historical levels of debt through our incorporation. Right now, we've only got one debt issue. It's less than five million dollars. I think it was four point seven million dollars to begin with, um, and so especially considering the age of our, our of our community, I would say that our debt levels have been very low compared to other municipalities. Thank and you. just a follow-up, would that be, uh, it, I mean, I'm not asking you to make assumptions or, or judgments, but is that because perhaps Obey is more risk-averse or debt-averse than other municipalities, for instance? Thank you. I'm always loath to ask staff the why questions, things are done in the past. Uh, but Mr. Pena, you may answer if you wish. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, through your worship, it's too speculative for me to answer that. But thank you for asking. Yeah. It's okay. Go ahead, Mr. Bean. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so I just wanted to talk about debt as well, because we do have some debt mentioned in our financial plan, but I wanted to remind Council, uh, council what, it, what role it plays in debt and what oversight uh, it has. Uh, in the community charter, a municipality can only borrow for specific purposes, and mainly those purposes are capital. There are some exceptions, but it's very uncommon for us to borrow for operating purposes. We can have a short-term borrowing bylaw for cash, law per or cash flow purposes, uh, but we don't, we don't need that. Uh, we've, got, uh, we've got cash to sustain operations, so we don't need that. Uh, we must borrow through our regional district, and that that creates a joint and several liability situation because basically it's the CRD that's borrowing for us, which means if we fail to pay our debt, everyone else in the CRD gets to pay our debt. Uh, and that is a very um, uh, appetizing thing to investors, and therefore our borrowing costs are very low. So the CRD takes on our debt, goes to the Municipal Finance Authority, borrows through them because the Municipal Finance Authority will issue a bond to an investor. And, but they'll tell the investors, listen, no one's going to default on this because if Oak Bay defaults, everyone else is going to chip in. Furthermore, the MFA has the authority to tax. So they, you, know, you get that tax bill, and you got to pay the seven cents a year to the Municipal Finance Authority. They don't want your seven cents. Seven cents. Seven <laughs> cents. Thank you. They uh, just want to maintain the ability to tax you should someone default. Yeah. Because then they can just snap up a tax requisition. Everyone in the province pays for it, and they maintain their AAA rating. And, and as I said, their debt is rated the highest rating that anyone can have, which is currently higher than the, the, the country of Canada. So it's an extremely uh, safe uh, uh, investment for investors, which is why we have access to very cheap debt. Also, Braithwaite. Um, thanks, and through you to um, Director Payne. Um, so what would happen then if every single municipality went to the CRD at the same time? What, what, what level of risk will the CRD impose on, on allowing debt? Mr. Payne? Uh, through your worship, uh, you know, uh, it, it's a hard question to answer. Now, they do every, it, it, twice a year. They contact all the municipalities for their debt issues. They do a spring and fall, and they say, if you, if you need one, you got to get your borrowing bylaw in place, and you got to send that over to us in advance. Um, clearly, they haven't um, been fearful of their debt load comparison to their ca capacity. Now, we will talk about uh, borrowing capacity coming up right now. So there's limits on how much municipalities can borrow. So even if everybody borrowed to their limit, there's a there's a mitigation of that risk at the regional board. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Uh, and so, yeah, that was my next point, is that there's an, a loan authorization, authorization bylaw required. So although council has requested a, a, a debt management policy, which provides your opportunity to provide your vision, um, you also will always have the ultimate say on whether or not we borrow debt when we bring forward a loan authorization bylaw. 
And that bylaw may require approval of the electors, uh, which essentially means um, you will either require a referendum on whether or not to, to take that uh, loan out, or you can use the alternative approval process, which is a, a counter petition process, um, basically saying, we're planning on doing this, tell us if you don't want us to do that. And, and the community can petition to formally require a referendum. So there's lots of checks and balances as to when um, uh, uh, debt can be taken on by a by a, a municipality. Currently, our our debt um, our debt levels are less than three percent of what the of what our limit is. So in in the 2022 financial plan, this is what we outline what we projected to be our our debt limit. Um, we were at 2.3 percent of maximum borrowing capacity in 2022, and through the various borrowings we were forecasting in the financial plan, we would get above 5.3 percent. Now I will note the 5 percent threshold is a interesting threshold. First of all, we can go up to 30 percent. That means that 30 percent of our ongoing revenues can be used for debt servicing, so interest and principal. Um, so uh, that's a lot of your tax dollar, 30 percent of your tax dollar going to debt. So you, you can borrow a lot. We're talking hundreds of millions of dollars for the District of Oak Bay. Currently, we've got less than um, uh, $700,000 that we've borrowed. Uh, so 100 times more than we've taken on, we can borrow according to our limit. Now, there's a 5 percent threshold. Basically, it's, it's the elector assent uh, free zone. And that basically means that the municipality is allowed to borrow under that 5% without seeking uh, approval of the electors. So if you wanted to borrow um, without uh, there being a referendum or having to use the alternative um, approval process, you can do that. Um, and council might want to think strategically about when to do that. Certain types of projects are more controversial. Um, we've got our facilities master plan that we'll be recommending, for instance, the replacement of some of our uh, strategic buildings, um, which may be more controversial than, say, replacing pipes in the ground. So if we go out to borrow for um, our sanitary sewer program, that's likely to, to gain support in the community over more controversial. So you may want to think about uh, which projects and if you use that electro-free ascent zone. Okay. Uh, now we'll talk a little bit about financial reporting. I think everyone should take their Red Bull shots again right now at the midpoint. <laughs> the first thing that we're required to produce is our public sector accounting standards. That's required by the community charter, and they're due to council by May 15th. Mr. Payne, just, to, uh, uh, just in terms of managing time here, at 7.45, I think we'll try and get this more or less wrapped up by 8. We have until 9 o'clock before we have this, but... Is, is 45 minutes to, to go through the balance, is that a reasonable amount, or are we uh, pushing time here? Oh, Your Worship, did you say 8 or 8.30? 8.30. Yeah, oh, more than enough time. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. I do like to hear myself talk about finances, but I'll, I'll try to wrap it up, for sure. Yeah, I think we're making reasonable process, and we, and we want to get to the asset management stuff, I would say. So that's due by May 15th. That's the wrong button, there we go. Uh, must be audited. Interestingly... The financial statements must not receive a clean audit. There's no requirement in the charter for it to say that the, the municipality receives an unaudited or an um, unqualified opinion. But if you have a qualified opinion, you should certainly be asking questions of your CFO or perhaps even your CAO. Um, and they must present budget versus actual. So after that uh, May 15th deadline, we have a June 30th deadline for a statement of financial information. That contains the financial statements within it and requires additional disclosures. Those disclosures include the schedule of remuneration, which will list your name, how much remuneration you've received from being on council, plus any related expenses that you've incurred to for those duties. And similarly, you'll have a schedule of remuneration for staff who have earned more than 20, uh, pardon me, $75,000 in the year, plus their expenses. You'll have a schedule of suppliers and goods and services that outlines any payment um, that uh, any any uh, supplier that we've paid over twenty five thousand dollars in the year, so that that keeps us honest in terms of who we're paying through throughout the year. 
Now to talk a little bit about the annual report. So we're kind of growing it, right? Like the financial statements are contained within the SOFI. The SOFI is contained within the annual report. The annual report has lots of other information that's not financial related as well. It's led by corporate services and it includes those things plus additional financial stats to meet the requirements of the award program as well as permissive tax exemptions. And then other financial reporting that happens throughout the year, we do the quarter two and quarter three budget variance reports. We do purchasing policy disclosures. For instance, we disclose to council any single payment made over $25,000 since the last report. Again, keeps us honest. We have investment policy disclosures. We disclose how much of our um, portfolio is invested in certain asset classes, investment asset classes. So that's a risk management procedure. And then we will be uh, disclosing surplus allocations as well. So I'm rolling right through it. I thought, you know, but that, I would do that at that pace anyways. It's the boring stuff. You know, looking backwards and reporting what you've done, that's the easy thing to do. Looking forward is, is more difficult. Uh, so purchasing. So I always get the question, you know, like what's the difference between purchasing and budget, right? Budget is the overall organization spending authority. So you've given the organization authority to spend $40 million in operation. Does that mean that your arborist should be buying fire trucks? No, right? So purchasing is really providing the authority to certain individuals to do certain purchasing. So what's appropriate in, in that case? And not only making purchases, but binding the corporation. So if I'm signing a document that binds the organization, if council then um, doesn't live up to those obligations or stealth staff, not, there's financial implications, right? So you need to make sure the right individuals in the organizations are making those decisions on your behalf. Um, and you know, I won't tell you all the legal machinations because it's not. This is indirectly uh, required in the community charter that purchasing authority. You are the purchasers of the organization, unless you say other people can do it. So you have to delegate that authority. It's not automatically delegated in any way, and you've done that through the delegation of, of administrative function bylaw. That's on our website as well. It identifies a specific. Um, positions that you've said can make purchasing and, and contract decisions for, for your organization. And that bylaw refers to our sustainable procurement policy, which is more detailed in those uh, delegations. Okay, So I'll just highlight some of the, the high level stuff there. The policy, the purchasing limits that council has approved is one to $25,000 for the department managers, so the deputies and whatnot. Uh, the directors can can sign a contract with a value of up to $100,000, and then the CEO up to a value of $250,000. Anything above that has to come to council for approval. Okay. Now, what is council's role in procurement? Um, first of all, you you integrate your vision into the procurement policy and practices. So I got that excellent question earlier about First Nations considerations. That's exactly what you what you do. You would integrate your values into how we go about purchasing policy. There's some limits, of course. Our trade agreements and case law provide some limits. Um, and you may provide direction on evaluation criteria in advance. So we, you know, if there's, uh, for instance, uh, a, a park playground replacement, council might have a vision for accessibility requirements or other values, and you want to have your say in advance. Um, so it's kind of incumbent on staff to be able to recognize that and say, oh, I think, I think this is a, a procurement where it's politically sensitive, it's uh, community, uh, very important to the community. Let's, let's approach council and ask for some of their direction on evaluation criteria in advance. Because once we've gone through the process, it's too late. We don't recommend that council take place in most uh, uh, evaluations, and the reason for that is evaluations have to be inherently objective to meet the case law requirements. Not that council can't be objective, but there's certainly a political opponent, a political component, and the evaluation has to be apolitical to maintain that objectivity. It may be appropriate and advisable, though, un under some circumstances. You may have designed your evaluation criteria and process to solicit council feedback in the process uh, because let's say perhaps um, community vision for the playground accessibility uh, is important during the process. Uh, as long as we've laid that out in advance in the competition, that's more than fair, right? And of course, council's role is to approve purchases that are over $250,000. Now, I won't say that when we bring purchases to council for approval that it's a rubber stamp. But I will say there are there may be legal and financial implications if you choose not to approve 
uh, compliant bid, especially in the case of a tender, you know, because a tender says it's basically a contract with the successful bidder. Uh, and if we've told them that we're going to enter into this contract and then council says no, then there's, there's potentially financial liability. RFP is a little bit different. An RFP, a request for proposal, is, you know, usually we have language lit littered in the RFP that says nothing's final, it's subject to council approval, this is not a, this is not a contract A, contract B situation, which a tender is, uh, so there's more, uh, there's more latitude there. But I'll, what I would just recommend to council is if you have any real concerns about approving a purchase, uh, don't decline it, have that conversation in, in a legal context in camera because you want to know what the legal um, implications of that decision might be. Okay, okay asset management. Um, so I don't really like to put giant blocks of words on the screen because, oh, yeah, question. Thank you. Just one question before you get, go on to asset management. The Ministry of M Municipal Affairs and Housing um, has... Um, a, a large information package that is a matter of public record with all kinds of statistical analysis on all of the communities, certainly within the province of BC. I know what I use them for, but I'm just wondering if you could explain um, the rationale of contributing the um, information to the ministry, what our obligation is, um, what staff may use it for, and what the ministry uses it for. Yeah, uh, through your worship, there is a large database of all sorts of information, and we're, we're required to submit uh, local government data entry statistics every single year. That's also got a May 15th deadline, so it's a very busy time for us. We input all of our um, financial statement information. We input as much asset management information as excuse me, we have on hand and tax information as well. Those are the main components. There's other things like uh, council remuneration and whatnot. Now, I would say that the main purpose of that data is for uh, external and academic use, because um, you're able to create an even playing field to compare municipalities, not just within the, uh, uh, the province of BC, but elsewhere. Uh, staff will sometimes use that information to compare, let's say, relative tax burden. Maybe council just want to know like how, how expenses if, is our community compared to others. There's obviously limitations to comparing apples to oranges that way, but um, it, it provides a gauge to council for, for measuring a, a burden and what have you. Um, so other than that, I would say there's not a ton of uh, internal use for it because we already have that you we already have those statistics internally, uh, except for the other the other communities. Yeah. Thank you. On to asset management. On to asset management. So I will read these definitions, mind you. I don't usually like it, but the uh, infrastructure, uh, the International Infrastructure Management Manual says that asset management is the combination of management, financial, economic, engineering, and other practices that are applied to our physical assets. And with the objective of, of, of providing a certain level of s uh, service in the most cost-effective manner. That's a good definition. But uh, I think another definition also hits the mark, which is the ISO 5500. And that's a, it, it defines it as a coordinated activity of an organization to realize value from assets. And the realization of value would normally involve the balancing of cost, risk, opportunities, and performance. And the reason I've got this one here is because asset management is really coordinating it's really about coordinating all of the asset management activities that we have. Now, typically, uh, that responsibility um, uh, is organized under engineering because they they manage, implement, build the majority of the assets in the district. Um, right now, you know, we've restructured it under um, um, finance, but it's it's you know, I, I'm not responsible for. Uh, putting pipes in the ground, but certainly helping all the departments coordinate and, uh, and integrate all that information together. Uh, and so what you really need is a department to champion it at any point of the, in an organization, and that's why that definition makes a lot of sense in that context. So here's some background in terms of how the district has matured in its asset management practices over the years. In 2015, Council directed that we develop an asset management program and in 2018, Council approved such a strategy and a policy. In 2021, Council directed that uh, we fast-track a long-term financial plan, and that was delivered in September 2021 in the form of our Sustainable Infrastructure Replacement Plan, also known as our SIR plan. So some of the major findings of that plan are such 
Uh, we have $900 million approximately in inventory valuation. That's all in 2021 dollars. Of that, $751 million is depreciable. So that means there's about $150 million of land, right? Because that's not depreciable. Hopefully, we don't have to replace that land as long as we're taking care of that land. Of that $750 million, there's only about six, well, there's only about $650 million that is our responsibility to maintain and replace. So you're probably thinking, well, what's that $100 million then what, between the $751 and the $653 million? Well, the district currently requires by bylaw um, for residents to maintain and replace their storm sewer water laterals. Um, so when those have failed, they're, they're required to come in and pay a user fee to have that replaced. Um, so we don't have the financial obligation of that built into the, into the long-term financial plan because it's, it's borne by the individual uh, rate payers. And council will hear once in a while, uh, you know, because usually a, a lateral gets replaced as a result of some sort of event that's, that's quite a disturbance. The storm sewer is backed up or something like that. They need to replace it. And uh, the resident finds out that they're on the hook to pay for the 5700 or $7,000 to replace it, and that's discomforting. Uh, so, you know, there are municipalities that take responsibility for that cost, and that's built into their financial model. It's not built into ours now. And so I just disclose that to council because it, uh, it surprises folks, I think, <laughs> uh, including council. Yeah. Go ahead, Councillor Watson. Um, thank you. Can I just ask you to repeat that? It, which proportion of the infrastructure is not ours to replace? Is it just laterals, or was there something else you said there? Thank you. Just laterals. We do own it, but we we uh, uh, place that burden of the cost of replacing it on the individual taxpayers. Yeah. Uh, the uh, SIR plan forecasts of $1.3 billion in spending between now and 2020. 2121. Again, that's in 2021 dollars, and we've seen a lot of price variation uh, over the last year due to the pandemic. So it's not worth trying to revise those numbers under current um, unpredictable uh, um, indicators. Over that time, we're predicting between 175 and 225 million dollars uh, in debt, um, and that's because we haven't built up reserves. Um, and, and, and debt's appropriate anyways in, in many situations. And of that infrastructure, we forecast about $270 million of those assets are past due for replacement. And what does that really mean? The National Asset Management Standards establish a recommended useful life for your assets, and that's balancing the risks and costs of those. And so, for instance, they'll say a PVC pipe will last 90 years or something like that. Well, we estimate that approximately $273 million of those are past that um, that normally acceptable risk level. Um, so there's a lot of catching up to do in the short term if we want to maintain those, those risk levels. Council can establish different risk levels. Uh, staff have never really been been able to empower council to make those decisions. We haven't been able to provide you with the information to say, do you want to choose a 100-year useful life for your water mains? And that means your water breaks are 5% more frequent. We've never given you that information. That That's that's the next stage of asset management maturity, really. Um, but nevertheless, it still paints a picture that even if it's less, even if it's $200 million, there's a lot of infrastructure that needs to be replaced. In fact, we modeled different variables. We said, well, what, what if we add 20% of useful life to our to our linear assets? What does that look like? Still came out with 200 million in overdue assets. So the broad findings of the report were validated that way, that there's a lot of infrastructure that we think should have been replaced by now. And so this is kind of another demonstration of what that looks like. We, you know, uh, we took the total value of our roads, buildings, drainage, sewer, and water, and we estimated how far are they through their useful lives, right? We estimated roads are 79% through their useful lives. So if you're saving up to replace all your roads, you would have saved up 79% of the value of the replacement of the, of the roads. That's the sustainable funding model. Um, it's not un uncommon. Municipalities uh, usually uh, have an unsustainable funding model, which requires more debt. Buildings, 67%. Drainage is our most appreciated asset with 85% of it through its useful life, uh, which is valued at $122 million. 
sewer system 77% and water 73%. And you can see there's a natural risk management happening here. You take the assets here that are, that are required for life safety, like water, and they're less depreciated than, say, uh, drainage, which is not a life safety issue. Um, so we've allowed a, a greater risk in, in, those, in those assets. And water is one of those ones where you don't want to wait till it fails. You want to replace those assets before they fail, right? Drainage, uh, you can, but it won't necessarily create a life safety issue. If you have a water main break, there's a potential for a system-wide contamination, that sort of stuff. So you want to really mitigate that. Councilor Green. Thank you, and through you to Mr. Payne. Mr. Payne, um, what about the sewer system, though? Is that not a life safety issue in terms of contamination and, and disease? Thank you. Okay. Uh, through your worship, I, I would say yes. I, I'm not an engineer, um, but uh, you know, the risk of a water main break and contaminants entering that system it is not the same as, say, a sanitary sewer. If you have contaminants enter this, this, the sanitary sewer system, well, there's no consumption uh, of that, right? So it is a greater risk. I would say that certainly there is life safety, though, involved, yeah. Thank you, Councilor Patterson. Thank you, Mayor, and through you to Mr. Payne. Uh, in the province of BC, what kind of discussion is going on with um, Asset Management BC about the impacts of climate change. I know it's shifting, and certainly in a lot of provinces throughout Canada, their outlooks for useful life of of systems, uh, particularly winter cities, are, are really hard hit by the changing climate. What 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 discussions, if any, are taking place at the province of BC? Uh, through your worship, I would say that uh, frameworks are being developed for best practices about integrating um, climate change predictions into this sort of modeling and into asset management practices. So, for instance, you know they've modeled the additional capacity that they think they require in this in the uh, storm drain system for more frequent and intense storms. So that's being integrated into uh, the engineering standards as you speak, because engineers, they have to do that, right? Um, there's, uh, uh, but you know, the thing about climate change is the impacts to private property are far more significant, or the predictions for the impact to private property are far more significant than to our infrastructure. We modeled it a little bit in our SERP plan, if you recall, but we put some pretty strict caveats around it. Um, and But we just did it with, say, storm drain, and we anticipated, well, if there's an X amount of additional capacity required, here's the extra dollars that are required, and we limited it to that. But I think um, there is certainly a movement. Uh, natural assets is one of those pieces that are is being asked for, um, and how natural assets can mitigate um, climate change uh, in, in your modeling. And Council's actually directed that um, a natural asset component be integrated into our drainage master plan, which is being prepared. So, yeah. Go ahead, Councillor Smart. Oh, through you, Mayor. Um, just to add on to that uh, discussion, Director Payne, um, at the Rising Economy Conference, they actually talked quite a bit about the idea of combining um, carbon footprint analysis with accounting. And um, I was curious just to add on to, and that's only one aspect of what you're touching on, but um, I believe this was in Vancouver they were giving um, the example of, but um, so that every deci financial decision that council faces also has an increase or decrease in our carbon footprint as part of that decision. So I was curious if um, uh, you had any um, thoughts around that about how how onerous that would be. Uh, they talked about rolling it out just for like one particular sector to start, like say do your transportation and just like start into that type of accounting. I was just curious um, for some feedback and discussion on that. Mr. Payne? Yeah, I would say, you know, the district hasn't developed uh, a, a sophisticated approach to including uh, the considerations of climate change in its decision making you know, when it comes to infrastructure replacement and uh, what have you. Now, when council's making decisions, generally speaking, you're making the decisions from a triple bottom line perspective. And naturally, you just want more information so you can make that decision uh, better with more information. And so how do how does staff go about preparing that? There are models out there that um, when making large capital uh, investment decisions, 
um, uh, provide uh, uh, information through the climate lens, the financial lens, the uh, labor force lens, and a couple other, you know, so that's e economics, environment. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, speaking candidly, we haven't developed any sophisticated way of reporting that here, although uh, council keeps that in mind when you're making your, your decisions. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, some of the further uh, surplan findings is we uh, we expect that their annual funding gap is about $4.6 million. And what does that mean? When you take the uh, replacement cost of the assets and you divide by their useful lives, we say that the annual funding, if you wanted to spread that funding over the life cycle of the assets, so spread that funding out over the maximum um, a period, it would be about $12.8 million. And we're currently set to assign $8.2 million meaning there's a $4.6 million. If you wanted to reach that target, you're, you're kind of forced to reach that target at some point because you take on debt to cover the shortfall and you have to pay for that debt with debt servicing. So you get there eventually, but you may want to get there in advance to uh, earn investment returns and also um, y y there's some intergenerational funding equity considerations there as well. Now, council specifically asked for this measure. I typically don't recommend that you report it because it can be um, uh, daunting and not helpful in many cases. But it absolutely is a relevant measure. And we um, we calculated what we're called a cumulative infrastructure funding gap of $463.5 million, meaning if we had saved up through the life cycle of our assets as they exist now, we would have replaced or would have in the bank $463 million. So we have that, that gap there. It doesn't mean that we were in the deficit by $463 million. It means we're going to have to take on some debt. We have to. And it's gonna, it means that we may have to, the next generation might have to pay a bit more than the previous generation. So their contribution, their annual contribution has to be higher to make up for the lower amount. That's what that means. And, you know, just to be fair, this is how long it took that infrastructure gap to build up <laughs> since 1906. So it's not something that any one council, one decision that any one council made. It's a cumulative impact of deferring funding, uh, set, not setting aside mm -hmm. funds because you don't have to yet. You have to find the funds when you have to replace the infrastructure, right? That's the point where council has to do it or abandon capital services. So you have that freedom not to fund things over the life cycle of his assets for a long time. And that's what's happened uh, through our history. But here's, here's an optimistic graph. <laughs> When we, when uh, in, in 2017 was around, after 2017, I would say council really significantly started increasing their annual funding. And you will notice that the 100 year funding gap uh, that was accumulating was about $800 million. You see the negative, uh, you can barely see it, but that red line goes below $800 million. That means we are we needed to spend 1.3 billion, but we're only setting aside half a billion. So there's an $800 million funding gap that had been foreshadowed. But just through the rapid increases um, in uh, taxes since 2018, you've solved a significant portion of that $445 million. So don't underestimate the impact that this council can have over the next 100 years. Uh, so that was four or five years of tax increases. And the SIR plan recommends 2% tax increases for the next six years to solve the next $460 million. And you see, you know, if that's our reserve balance, you see the green line, it still goes negative a little bit because we still have to take on that $200 million in, in debt. Um, or we have to really increase taxes at an astronomical rate. Uh, but overall, we stay relatively stable over the 100 years. We've set aside $1.3 billion. We've spent $1.3 billion, the matching revenues to expenditures. So we recommend 2% a year for six years. Council can change that. Uh, if you wanted to do it over a longer term or a shorter term for a period, you can do it. It's kind of one of these sort of exercises. And uh, water and sewer utilities were recommended 2.5% for eight years. The financial impact, although the, the percentage impact of that is higher, 2.5 versus 2, the financial impact of that is a lot lower because water and sewer utilities are low, they're a lot smaller than, than your tax totals. And that would eliminate $460 million over the next 100 years. And then the last 
thing that was recommended from that plan is you know really significantly escalate your infrastructure replacement by 300 to 500 percent and council has shown support for that by um, approving five FTEs to be funded uh, in the engineering department so you know there's a the progress that that we've made 2017 you were at 31 percent of annual funding 2022 you're at 70 percent this the uh, financial plan up to 2026 projected you get to about uh, 91 percent Councillor Watson. Thank you, and through the mayor to you, uh, Director Payne. Um, just to uh, make sure I understand this last graph particularly, again, that is without taking on any debt. It is just purely through increasing operating revenue to cover the shortfall. All right. Yeah, Thank that's you. correct. No debt. Yeah. I think, if I may, though, I think realistically there still has to be debt paid. That's just some of that funding sustained will start paying off the debt not just the not just paying into reserves at some point yeah correct because debt is really a, a large cash inflow and then we need to pay the principal and interest and that comes from your sustainable funding stream so but you know over the, over these next years this this progress doesn't include that consideration but at some point you'd have to take on debt it becomes part of your sustainable funding stream yeah go ahead Councilor Braithwaite then Patterson um, thanks so much. Just a quick question. Are we going to have access to this um, PowerPoint after the meeting? Because I'm trying to madly write some stuff down, but I, I just realized it's easier if I just ask for the PowerPoint. Uh, through your worship, uh, you know, I, I'd be happy to post it on the asset management webpage and share out that link just so the community can have access to it as well. For sure. Okay, great. Thank you. Councilor yeah. Patterson? Yes, thank you, Mayor, and um, just confirmation from Director Payne that in the asset management um, policy, Council's role is for understanding risk and funding, correct? Correct, absolutely, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, and so I just want to make a plug for sustainable funding, why it's important. Um, we've largely we've missed somewhat of an opportunity in Oak Bay because our assets are, are, are long through and we haven't saved in this model um, but take for example take for example this 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 example where you've got let's say a, a pipe that needs to be replaced in 80 years and it's worth a hundred thousand dollars to replace it and suppose that we will earn two percent uh, investment interest on that on those reserve contributions over the life of the asset so you'd ask yourself, well, how much do we have to set aside per year? And the simple solution is to take the $100,000, divide by 80, that's $1,250 a year. If you set that aside, at the end of 80 years, you'll have $100,000 in your bank account. But the question is, well, how much money could I earn with investment income to reduce that cost to the taxpayer? And the answer is, you would only have to set aside $506 a year as opposed to $1,250 per year. So you can more than half the cost to the taxpayer by investing proactively in, in reserves over the life cycle of an asset. Because you see that the cumulative investment returns by year 60 or so, they exceed the cumulative tax-funded reserve contributions. And that's with a 2% uh, investment return. And again, the Municipal Finance Authority, they've established some uh, really high yielding funds now. They have an equity linked fund. It's called the DMAC fund, the, D the Diversified Multi Asset Class Fund, that's expected to return uh, over 8% annually over, on average. Some years you'll have minus 10%, some years you'll have plus 20%. But supposing you, you started a, a municipality today and you implemented this model and you uh, invested in the DMAC fund because you could your taxpayers would have to pay next to nothing for the replacement of their infrastructure because the compounding interest on that would be so, so large. So this is just a plug for, you know, we're so far down the life cycle of the assets where we've lost a lot of this opportunity, but the next generation after this replacement cycle may have that opportunity uh, with, uh, with council direction there. Go ahead, Councillor Patterson. Thank you. I mean, that's, certainly illustrates the opportunity, but how does it factor in the um, the higher cost of unscheduled uh, replacements or maintenance um, and the, the impact of inflation um, on the modeling? Just 
Dr. Payne? Yeah, it's a great question. And um, I think the inflation piece is really significant because, okay, so you're setting aside $506 per year, but then you have a 5% inflation in the next year. So all of a sudden you need to set aside more. Well, the idea uh, in your financial plan uh, budget of forced growth also applies to your infrastructure replacement. So if you experience economic factors that force you to increase funding to provide the same level of service, you need to increase the, your taxes. So let's say we settle an agreement with, uh, with QP, they have a 2% increase in their wages. We have to increase wages by 2% to maintain the same existing service levels. The same can be said about infrastructure. If the infrastructure unit rates go up by 5%, that $506, we should increase it by, by 5%. You know, and I talked to the uh, the CEO of the Municipal Finance Authority. and said, "Is it fair to say that your long-term funds um, out um, outperform inflation?" And the answer is yes. But you have to have the principled approach to your investments. Where if I put money in the mortgage fund, you got to leave it there for four years. Otherwise, you could incur a capital loss. So it takes a discipline. Yeah. Thank you for that. So there's some other activities besides this financial piece. This is just the financial part of, about asset management that we'd like to uh, undertake in, in the portfolio coming up. We want to procure asset management software. We want to develop an infrastructure risk register, uh, refresh the asset management strategy and policy, and excuse me, develop a project management governance framework. We also might need to refresh some of our condition assessments. We've done cctv of most of our linear assets except for water, which can't be CCTV'd. Uh, we've got uh, some old pavement condition assessments. We could redo that. But all of that goes into a risk register and a prioritization model, which can be integrated into your asset management software. It's a lot of work, but it's, uh, it's the next phase of our maturity in asset management. And that will allow us to optimize our program. Currently, we don't have I, I, uh, um, a well-integrated uh, capital program. We have separate capital programs. But, you know, just talking to the public works manager the other day, he says, you know, uh, it's great that council has increased the budget for pavement management, and I'm going and I'm replacing all the pavement where I know we're not going to have underground infrastructure problems, so we're maximizing that. But at some point, he will have paved all of that over, and we need to know uh, where we can replace sanitary sewer, water, and storm all at the same time and maximize those funds. And that's what, so we need to develop that. And all of that together would form your comprehensive asset management plan. So you've got pieces of your comprehensive asset management piece all together. Uh, so the so I've got two things remaining. I got eight minutes. I'll I'll rush through risk management a bit, uh, which is a risky endeavor. <laughs> and then I just want to touch on some of the financial challenges that the district has that you'll see evidence of in the financial plan. So Mr. Payne, we don't have a hard cut off at eight thirty. I was just yeah. trying to keep us on a on a reasonable time mark here. <laughs> so don't don't panic. Uh, okay. Rush things that are important. So go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so risk management, it's really a, it's a corporate function and it, it's a function by everyone. Right now, much of the uh, liaising and facilitating of risk management activities happen through the, the, uh, the finance uh, section. Uh, right now, our insurance is through the Municipal Insurance Association of BC. That's a self-insurance program that was formed by BC municipalities, nonprofit for our for our benefit, and that came out of a period, an economic period, where there was a real hard insurance um, uh, experience, and there was no underwriters that were willing to take on the risk. So they formed a, a self-insurance program. We are a party, so we, we, we signed the Liability Protection Agreement. That's what all municipalities that are part of the MIBC signs. And that uh, agreement requires that we not voluntarily assume liability or settle any claim, which is covered under that protection agreement. And that kind of restricts counsel a little bit. Um, basically, it says that um, you know you shouldn't be offering to settle with with uh, with um, uh, anybody in the community who has experienced a loss uh, because that might assume liability and then our our uh, insurance would be um, we wouldn't have insurance for that so it would open up our liability and 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 that's I mean that's an issue for all communities um, where a, a citizen has experienced some sort of 
I, I use a word, uh, ca ca catastrophe, or they've had a backup and, uh, and their private property has been damaged. The municipality has broad liability protections under the Local Government Act. It basically says that if we've established a policy for maintaining our assets uh, and we abide by that policy, uh, then we've got broad liability protection. So we can't be held responsible for uh, a major uh, storm event that causes backup into people's private property. And, you know, whatever service level you've established, ours is mainly a reactive model. So when we hear about issues in our, in our system, we, um, we go and fix it. That's our, if we live by that policy, then we're, we, we're immune in many ways from liability. If, however, we're aware of an issue with a storm drain and we ignore it, for a, then that's negligence uh, under, under the case law. Um, and, and I see a question, but I'll just finish my thought here. There, there's also, you know, we're also discovering the areas of town where there is uh, significant deterioration in, in some of our infrastructure, but we have to prioritize it because we only have a certain amount of capacity. So that's our policy. And if we're found to follow that policy, then we have broad liability protection. However, if we, um, out of empathy, decide that we want to um, take on liability of, of folks that have experienced that, it can have much broader implications to our liability. So there's a question from Councillor Smart. Councillor Smart. Through you, Mayor. Uh, Director Payne, I was wondering how this um, would play out, um, having a um, smaller reach in insurance um, with having an earthquake issues, like just thinking of Christchurch and how a lot of the smaller insurance companies actually went broke. Um, and I'm just wondering, does this put us at greater um, risk um, in an earthquake catastrophe? And is there anything we should be doing to mitigate that risk? Mr. Payne. A great question. Now, I'll say, for the most part, the municipality won't be liable for the impacts of an earthquake because it's a catastrophic event that's outside of our uh, of our ability to um, to do anything about. However, the the principle of the question is a great question, which is, uh, if there's an event that creates a ton of liability that we'd be subject to, is the municipal insurance association of BC capitalized enough to handle that? What will happen? And they have. Um, they have requirements to, um, uh, they can only underwrite, which means they're the, they're the primary insurance for a certain percent, uh, percentage of the portfolio, and they're required to uh, co-insure by purchasing insurance from another underwriter for the remaining. So it kind of mitigates that risk uh, uh, among uh, more, uh, more insurance folks, not just within the BC. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Councillor Watson. Thank you, Mayor, and through you, Mayor, to uh, uh, Director Payne. Just back to your comment about general liability protection under the Local Government Act. How does that line up to the fact that we have a fairly large overdue infrastructure account? Can you keep claiming that even if you're not funding the, the work? <laughs> I, I could only speculate at what point the courts would say, you know, well, you've refused to replace your infrastructure, therefore you're you're liable. But currently, you know, th there's nothing abnormal about our infrastructure condition in the context of Canadian infrastructure. So that's one that's one thing. But the other thing is, again, um, our policy with respect to uh, infrastructure that's in poor condition is. We're gonna. We only have limited amount of funds, so we're gonna prioritize the best. And as long as we are living up to that policy, we've got that liability blanket. Thank you for sure. Yeah. Thank you. So all that said, it's prudent for staff to facilitate claims. Um, so if you get it, if you get a claim, please direct them towards staff, and we will liaise with the Municipal Insurance Association, who will, um, who will uh, adjudicate their claim. So some of the financial challenges, and we talk a little bit about insurance premiums on this slide as well. This is the last slide, by the way, Council. Uh, good job. <laughs> uh, first one uh, is inflation. Uh, so you'll see the impact of inflation in our forced growth factors of our, of our budget. This is just to paint a context. Uh, the Canadian CPI is 6.3% for the last reporting 12 periods, which I believe was October through October. 
So that's the last annualized. And then Victoria is six, was 6%. Now that doesn't mean that our force growth factors are 6%. The municipal, the, the factors that impact municipal services are different than this basket of goods, but it just, it paints a picture that we're at an escalated, uh, we're at an escalated um, uh, environment right now when it comes to uh, our force growth. So, you know, when I take that principal approach at budget, um, I look at every class of expenditure we have and I determine what is, you know, how much of that purchasing power has eroded and how much should we add to the budget to maintain the exact same service levels. So, for instance, could, uh, Victoria CPI says office supplies have gone up by 3%. So I'll, I'll apply a 3% force growth factor to office supplies. But for equipment, um, it's 5%. So I've, I've applied a 5%. For our QP, uh, whatever we settle with QP. <laughs> uh, so 0%, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, so whatever happens there, that's a force growth factor. So it will be, it, this isn't necessarily in, indicative of all our classes of expenditure, but it, you know, last year inflation was below 3%. So we have labor negotiations underway, but we always do, it seems, because we're always doing it after the fact. QP negotiation, uh, both QP, IFFA, and Oak Bay Police Department, they all expired in 2021. So we're, those are all underway as we speak. Parks, Rec, and Culture revenues are um, under strain uh, still, but they're improving. At the onset of the pandemic, we had uh, uh, we had predicted two and a half million dollar drop in our Parks, Rec, and Culture revenues from the pre-pandemic budget. Um, council elected to use the COVID-19 restart grant to prop up those operations and continue those operations. Um, we're now, we're trending in the right direction. We're now at about a seven hundred dollars to $800,000 gap between our pre-pandemic net financial um, results versus what we're looking at in next year. So we're getting there. And we still got some money in the COVID-19 restart grant reserve to support that. But it's finite, so you know, if we don't get back to pre-pandemic levels, council will be in a, a position to either increase taxes or decrease service levels. Infrastructure, enough said about that. Reserves and debt, enough said about that. Insurance premium, we're still in a hard market, is what they call it. So our insurance premiums have been going up by 10%. Our property and general liability insurance premiums. What is happening is the broader market is consolidating so the major underwriters in the world are consolidating so there's less competition as well as now they're modeling climate change into their premiums which they've seen the impacts of climate change and they've seen that their previous premiums were too low compared to what actually materialized that's kind of like a sustainable funding model in itself right um, so we're still seeing double digit there uh, happening and WorkSafe BC premiums, although they're they're actually a minor part of the budget, they're still significant. And our industry rates are rising significantly, and that's due to a number of factors. Uh, industry rates are they're outside our control completely, right? And just the fact that the WorkSafe program has expanded significantly, so now there's presumptive language in there, for instance. So, if um, uh, if uh, if uh, a, a fire a past fire employee develops a, a condition that can be assumed to be a, a a result of the job, they're provided for coverage without. It's just presumed. Uh, so that expands how much coverage we need to provide. The maximum that we can provide under the uh, under WorkSafe BC has gone up. So the government has increased that, and the different things that are recognized as uh, occupational. Um, uh, health and safety issues has expanded like PTSD and, ex and et cetera. So despite what the good efforts that we can do here, those rates have risen uh, considerably. We're also at a premium for our specific, there's the, uh, the WCB adds uh, uh, an organization specific premium or discount. We're still at a premium uh, due to, you know, some unfortunate events in the community over the last decade. However, um, this year, I think, will be the first year that we've seen a drop in that premium. So we're still above the average, but we've seen it. We've seen a drop, and but there's still more work to do on that one for sure. So, so that's 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 the conclusion of of the entire uh, package, there. So I thank you very much for bearing with me. Thank you very much, Mr. Payne. I, I want to give a little shout out to the occupational health and safety uh, officer and and HR because that that drop has been. 
uh, you know, only possible through a lot of the good work that's happened on that department. That's a fairly new department um, for that. Can I ask uh, on this? There's <clears throat> one of the things that we struggle with, I think, uh, is sort of hidden shifts of service levels that aren't necessarily reflected. So I'll give it a, an easy example of where we used to run around with uh, like Roundup and spray all the weeds on the sidewalks. And it was a very low cost model because we went around and did it every couple of months and it was done with one employee. Uh, now we don't do that anymore, so we have to find alternate. There's no cheap uh, or simple way. You have to do it with weed whackers or manually or, or other. So <clears throat> for the same cost, we're getting much less lower, lower levels of service, and we don't necessarily catch that in the budgeting process because the, it's just, well, we have a person who does that, they're part of this team, and, and so how do we find ways in our budgeting process of sort of capturing those service levels uh, changing just because of changing regulatory or other reasons that come along? It could be just be that things are, have wider cracks, and so there's now 10 times as many weeds, for example, that we haven't quite you know, caught up with. Uh, to your worship, it's imperfect, but the idea is that as 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 more of the organization is um, familiar with the service level approach, they self-identify that sort of things, and we and we bring that to council for consideration. Or when council makes those service level decisions, then it, they don't necessarily see it as a service level thing, but it ends up being that. Uh, I'll just as an example, um, uh, banning gas gas blower gas leaf blowers, for instance. Uh, if council wants to do that, then no problem whatsoever. There's either a financial impact to maintaining the same service level, or there's a service level impact to maintaining the same financial impact. And so we endeavor to just make that clear to council, and which decision do you want to make? The service level, uh, maintain the service level for more, more money, or reduce the service level for more, for less finances. Uh, but it's imperfect, and uh, staff don't. Sometimes they don't realize that that's happening because what can happen is you get now a new regulatory requirement. Uh, let's say you need more lifeguards by by regulation, and so what does a parks, rec, and culture department do? They find ways to save money. But if if finding ways to save money means reducing a service level, we really should be coming to council and telling you that and asking you that. So I, you know, I, I I'm proud of how uh, the, the organization has responded to that over the last number of years, because it's really a shift of thinking, and that shift hasn't occurred in other municipalities necessarily, so uh, it's just going to take practice, I think. Thank you for that. Are there other questions for Mr. Payne? You've left us in stunned silence, except for Councillor Appleton. Go ahead, Councillor Appleton. <laughs> It would, uh, not so much a question, Your Worship, but I just through you, I just wanted to say to Mr. Payne, I, I appreciate the mention of um, the concept of uh, intergenerational funding equity, um, and that's something that I think that we, as as a council, need to seriously consider. I think, beginning my second term, over the course of the last term, uh, with Boris and the staff team's assistance, it was very clear uh, the direction that needed to be taken and the investments in infrastructure that you've laid out. Um, you know, were, were, were clearly necessary and cl clearly needed that investment. And I think that as we head into this new five-year financial plan process, I think keeping that idea of intergenerational equity uh, in mind is significant because to me at this at this point in, in my service on council, um, it seems that, that we're approaching a bit of an inflection point between, you know, what is reasonable, you know, what, what is the appropriate investment into long-term infrastructure, in, in, in long-term infrastructure, and also this intersection of facilities that need to be replaced and significant inflationary increases and all of these things that the community needs in the near term as well. So uh, it, to my mind, anyway, I don't know your perspective on it from the financial perspective, but from a governance perspective, it seems like we're approaching that inflection point pretty pretty soon, and, and it's not going to be an easy decision point. Thank you, Councillor Appleton. Councillor Green? Thank you. And just to add to that, I think the other one, and I, I think that that one, I, I actually took a photo of that one chart that you showed in terms of um, the percentage of usage and, and lifespan and so on on each of those major areas. It's climate change. It's it's the, the whole issue of climate change, and I, I really think in that in that context as well, it's it, it's not just an inflection point. It's a critical juncture, and I, it I'm you know I'm I haven't seen that before that slide, and it, it is um, it, it's pretty sobering actually. Thank you. Thanks for the presentation. Excellent. 
Yes, thank you, Mr. Payne. Uh, there are no decisions to be made tonight. We're just here to um, to receive this and uh, and uh, ask questions. So, any other questions? Uh, I'll take a motion to receive. Move and second. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion? Uh, I'm yeah. Go ahead, Councillor Watson. Just a comment through you. Thank you very much for a newcomer to Council. I really appreciate the very comprehensive overview. I really feel way more up to speed. And thank you for your patience with my many questions. I think I get the award for asking the most. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> you Councillor Watson. It is an award. I think you know it's really important that we understand the context. And I think it's actually helpful for the public as well to, uh, to understand this if they're watching. Um, I'm just going to leave this with a, a, a one sort of piece of, of how powerful a decision making is. Though I mean, I, I think that not that chart that showed the the change of 445 million over that uh, is pretty positive in terms of the actual what what over five years you can do with yes some some larger tax increases but but some really directed uh, pieces of that. Um, I also really appreciated the, uh, I should say, appreciate um, what has started uh, uh, under your leadership, uh, Director Payne, this sort of holistic look at our total costs. And I think the asset management piece of this is really important. But, you know, as we're able to start pre-investing and, and getting ahead of these curves, you know, those, those thoughts that we can, you know, as we're saving up our money, you know, getting return on investment to keep the, to offset the inflationary costs. I always look at, you know, how we're running a municipality, you know, running in perpetuity uh, as a sort of an annual life cycle piece and, and, and mapping that out. We should have very predictable uh, costs and measures. And it's just, I think it's taken us a long time to get to the point where we're starting to think in those sort of 100 year cycles and how we manage those pieces. Um, it's extremely positive in terms of our, our long term financial outcome to be, to be having those pieces. And I just want to express my appreciation to you and your team. Uh, and, and frankly, all the leadership team in the different departments who have embraced this model of, of looking at, at how do we keep the life cycle, the total cost of the municipality over the, over the multi-generations that happen at, at, a, at the lowest possible level while maintaining the services. And I, it's just, it has been a real sea change of, of, of approach and, uh, and, and a lot of support from council, but also an enormous amount of work and leadership from staff. So I just want to express our appreciation for that. Um, we probably won't be quite so positive, but we have to start realizing we don't have that much money in their budget yeah. process. But uh, we, uh, it's it's very much appreciated at a, at a macro level here from the from the municipality. So we have a motion to receive on the floor. I'm happy to call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed. Uh, is there any new business uh, for members of council? Just, I, I just have a question. Go ahead. Uh, just a question from the beekeeping presentation that we had with uh, uh, with the bylaw suggestions that that he was bringing forward what's the next step that we would look at something like that so I'll, I'll turn to mr. Coates here in terms of pieces I mean we don't direct staff at this table but we could make him a, a recommendation um, to, or just an ask of, of council or of staff to come back with uh, implement, implement you know uh, recommendations around this um, that would come back to council for actual direction at the next meeting, if that was the will. And that would come back with a, a, re a report basically saying here would be the impact of that. Um, but Mr. Coates, do you have any um, feedback on that? Um, Mayor Murdoch, through you. So I think a um, couple different approaches uh, I could. You just turned yourself off. No, I just. I'll try that again. A couple of different approaches I, I could suggest. One is, uh, I think, in order for it to actually occur, um, you know, the most, the first thought I had was um, a council member could pick that up and and uh, provide a notice of motion to, to give it some direction around what sort of um, uh, thoughts you'd like from staff to to get that started. And and I don't think this is necessarily a big one, although it's it's uh, these regulations are embedded in the zoning bylaw, so there is some complexity around that and some process. And so, you, you know, it would it would depend. Perhaps it's a, a, a quick new initiative backgrounder that council might want to give direction to. But I think the notice of motion would be a, an approach, as well as um, you know uh, someone bringing that forward otherwise as a as a matter of business. But I think I think that's probably the best approach. So we could do it one of two ways. One could be a general notice of motion here. I'd probably recommend that we do a notice of motion under new business at the next council meeting to have a little bit of time to think about the wording and, and bounce it off of staff so that it's as clear as possible. I don't like the, we've had a few notices of motions where it's like, I think I wanna 
Is this generally, and then it comes back and it's different or it's not a guideline? So if that's 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 either one is viable. Uh, go ahead. Uh, thank Phillips. you, Member. Yeah, and just you know, as a best practice too, that um, sort of coming to a, a conclusion on a delegation that evening is essentially sort of not not a best practice and, and sort of giving it some thought and then considering it at another time is is typical and I, I apologize that I'm not intimately familiar with all the nuances of the district's procedures by law but certainly other municipalities I've worked in precluded that from happening at that meeting and uh, I don't know that ours does Ms. Williams would probably be sharper on that than me but uh, certainly from a best practice point of view a, a little second thought and bringing that forward at another time is, is certainly advisable thank you Anything else on our new business? It's a good question to ask, though. I think we want to mm -hmm. establish our good processes here early. Um, don't see any, so we just need a motion to adjourn. Seconded. Seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? Unopposed? That carries. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody, for watching at home. I hope you got some value out of that, and uh, we will see you all next week.